going to save the city 66%. Uh, you film? You film it. I see everybody. Welcome. All right, welcome everybody to Bitcoin Workshops number 87. We are here live at the Cowboys Casino in Calgary, Alberta. And we are here on a Thursday night with the whole gang. And we are talking about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, the marketplace. We'll call it maybe some uh, some investing for some people. We'll call it some, uh, some snooping for others. We'll do all kinds of stuff tonight. As usual, the disclaimer is there's no advice. So if it sounds advicey, it's not. And we're just hearing it wrong. Um, what we do every Thursday that we do this is get together and just talk about what's been happening, what we're doing, how we're coping with the marketplace, is it bear, is it bull, um, where, the, where the sweet spots are at, where the new technology lives, understanding the technology a little more, learning about blockchain, learning about cryptocurrency, and learning about how all that finance and the digital world is going to affect us in the near future. Okay? So a lot of you are at home and other people are listening and you guys are here tonight. And there's su we're such a small percentage. Corey was telling me something tonight, and I was like, "Remember, we're we're like the micro of a one percent of society that like knows what's going on, right?" So it's like we, we have a long way to go still, okay? And even though we all think everyone knows it and they heard Bitcoin, they've just heard a name and they've heard a brand or they've heard a, a word, right? But until you actually embrace it, buy some, get a wallet, get a software, get involved, you don't really know what what it is that you have, okay? And the best way they like to describe what what it is, they're like digital bars of gold. Okay? And you buy a percentage of that bar, just like you buy an ounce of gold or whatever you do. And, and we really believe, I at least believe, that, that Bitcoin is a bar of gold in the digital format. So, so many other people are online, you guys have all seen something somewhere, and they all play in their thing and all that good stuff. Draper, you know, he's talked about Bitcoin being a quarter million dollars in the near distant future, right? And, and I can see it happening just because I've done the math, I've been keeping up with what's going on, and I've been in the scene now. Um, 87 weeks in a row, right? And I've had my uh, my ear to the to the grindstone on this whole thing, and um, I could see it being 250k. I could see it being a million dollars, like some of those other people said it. But when, how, how long? All those questions, I don't know the answers. I don't have the magic ball. But uh, but but what's coming down the pipe for you, new people too, is that the finances of Bitcoin and the way the algorithm is working is going into a have again. And every time it has. Um, the shortage of supply increases big time. So then the, the value of it is intrinsic, so that it will go up. And this halving is supposed to happen sometime, I think, next year, later in the year, or they said early 2021. 20, still don't know by the velocity still, right, of the mining and all that. But the halving is coming, and it's definitely on the timeline. It's, it's an occurrence that you can't avoid. So, so when that does kick in, we're going to see value escalate, okay? And it's, it's, it's going to happen with, with or without us. So don't forget that. So right now we're out for burgers tonight, and uh, and I'm at my one of my favorite burger joints, and the owner's my old friend for 30 years, and he's a cool guy, and he's asking me about Bitcoin tonight, you know, for the first time, and it's 10k, 10.5 today, Canadian guys, 10,550, and he's asking me about it for the first time, and I'm like, man, you know, you can see he doesn't want to miss out right now because he already saw what happened to other friends, and they probably talked from last year and all these things, so. It's interesting to see kind of almost like a second or third wave of open eyes in the community and, and regular people just stepping out of it and looking and looking deeper. Um, tonight we have some special guests. We're going to get into some cool conversations. we are here about some really neat projects. We're going to learn a little bit more from them than we have before. And, uh, and we're going to go deep on a few things. So let's jump, into, uh, let's jump into our favorite website, which is mine and that's bitcoinworkshops.ca and on here you've got a little bit of cool things happening as far as resources you've got links to some of the websites that you want to be part of here and uh, you can hit these tabs and I've got a you know like a referrer link on a couple of them here and then you get credited some money in your account if we uh, hey you watching online there are you? awesome thanks hi Neil he's watching on his phone so so what we have is uh, what we have is um, these, these mechanisms of, of uh, wallets and savings. So I just explained, a lot of the, the females in the world of crypto love Coinbase. They, they want riskless, you know, hey, come on in, Matt. Welcome. And they want a good time and they, they don't want to fret. So Coinbase is insured. So Coinbase insures the crypto, one of the few in the, in the world that does that, um, if, if not one of the only. Um, Binance is also a wonderful website for buying uh, altcoins and all the other cryptos. Um, they were recently hacked. Did, uh, did, I did question the, uh, the validity of their, of their programming and their authority, then, and Kevin's naughty, and it's like, we've seen so much about Binance, hey? Listen to the hogwash for a year and a half, and all of a sudden, you know, it's still how many Bitcoins out of the back door, right? 
two years in a row on the same day. There you go. So there's the some kind of work. Of Bitcoin. See. Whoa. Seven thousand Bitcoin four times. And welcome, Neil. Hey. Welcome back. What you guys will see too happen. It's pretty nice. Today. Good turnout. Uh, what you guys will see happen now is is all of this stuff is is really sleuth, and they're going, who's doing what, and this guy claims this, and it's almost like a massive conspiracy in some of this stuff, guys. Well, so. and the best thing about that Binance hack, so because it's blockchain, everybody can see what happened. Yeah. So now they're tracking those coins, right? It's almost the like the community a, is tracking those coins to see where they go and spend and everything. And when they try and Cash them in an exchange or whatever, they're just getting that one. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, who's, who's got them? Yeah, and it's Binance and, and a few, not just Binance, a few of the other exchanges and the Blockchain Federation and a few of the brands. So yeah. It's interesting that that's their, they're their own place, right? Really. Mm -hmm. the, um, the world of, of, uh, of regulators out there, though, are, are talking a lot now and they're always in the news and people are claiming the SEC is going to get involved with these things and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people don't understand that Bitcoin does not run on the system of the government and it doesn't run on a railroad that can be stopped. It's not, it's not something like that. Everything about Bitcoin is a volunteer mechanism. All the servers and the miners and everything that's up in the air holding it up is all a volunteer basis. So no one's getting, you know, it's not like some bank is paying somebody you know, to hold this up and run this stuff. So really the only way that, that they could turn off you know, anything Bitcoin or anything crypto is just to shut the power down, shut the internet down, and, and, and this kind of thing. So if that does happen, then, we're, then it's going to happen to everything. Like point of sale machines won't work and the whole world will stop. Satellites. Right? The what? We'll go to satellites. Oh yeah, we'll go to satellites at that point. But no, you know that, right? Like everything can't stop. So Bitcoin's being held by the people. It's in a volunteer mechanism and, and you can't stop Bitcoin. So keep that in mind. You guys have nothing to fear uh, holding on to that, okay? Um, one of the things I want to say is get good quality uh, software, right? Ask me. That's why you guys come out on Thursdays. That's why you guys, most of you know me and some of you are new and thank you for coming out tonight. I'll give you my card and stuff. Everyone else here can help you guys answer questions too. But, but one of the reasons you guys come out and do this with us is to learn what the good quality products are, the good quality softwares. And, you know, I tried a bunch of them and most of these are all top quality. I'm going to update this list for the end of the month because we've got some new stuff now. But even the brands are the same, you can find them in your phones. And like I Am Token has a 2.0 version, which we like. And uh, same with Jax, has Jax Liberty, which is made in Canada. And we always recommend that brand. It's the orange one there, the J-A-X-X. So made in Toronto, uh, awesome company. Talked to the CEO on the phone a long time ago about my magazine and stuff. And uh, really cool people. And uh, then people always ask me how to store their, their crypto savings and, and things like that securely. That ledger here, the word ledger, you guys can search that and Google that too and buy yourself one directly from the website. It's one of the coolest devices to hold all your crypto coins and, and wealth yes. in your crypto. And then you can pop that thing in the safe and all that. And then they always say, well, what if I lose that little USB thing? Well, if you lose it, you can still go online to the website with your same passwords that you had for the device and then re-establish your account and your funds that way. So you've got a and B, you know, in the plans you there, so you're not going to be screwed, right? There's probably a C too, but I, I haven't got to C yet, because most people... Oh, the seeds. Oh, the seeds? Yeah, you can keep your seed. You keep your seed phrase and all that stuff, on. then you go online. You bet. So it's cross, it, it crosses between the two, right? Um, Coin Market Cap, that's our site that we use every week. It's on here. And I want you guys to know something else too, that this is very much an international thing that we're doing with crypto. It's running 24 hours a day, 365. Uh, the majority of the velocity is in the eastern part of the world. We're in the western world. We have good banking, good credit, and a lot of great you know, established things. So we're not as aggressive as they are in the eastern side of the planet. So keep that in mind. So a lot of the velocity, a lot of the buy-in, a lot of the results that we're actually winning from or are gaining from is the velocity and momentum that's happening on the east side of the planet. Go ahead, Neil. Could you go up to the top? We had a, my name on the left-hand side. I had a Cineam card uh, account in my cell phone. Yep. And then I upgraded my phone, and I went, uh-oh. So I went to my safe and I was crossing, I just didn't have time. I finally got the seeds into my new phone. Yep. I went, hey, it works. Of course it does. So and you're surprised cool, and happy? Man. I was like, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're happy that you saved your seed oh and not the opposite of bitching because you lost your seed. Yeah. Phrase, right? I transferred that to my new wallet. You know, of course, so, of course. So, so I have a question. What is seed? Oh, here's the thing in the space. People call 
the, the blockchain address a hash, they call it, they call the, uh, the 12 key words, that's your password to the whole device, a seed, a seed word, a seed thing. So there's different terminologies going on, but wallet's still a software, you know what I mean, right? So just different words, but the seed is and just the- you don't uh, record your- Your, your 12 word password, then yeah. What? Then your SOL, man. You lost yeah, shit out of luck, but I heard one really guy, he 100%, lost, yeah. His wife lost the seeds, it was, it, it was Bitcoin when it was like, Twelve cents, twelve dollars. Yeah. He said you told my buddy yesterday that was ninety-six million to be today. Oh my God! And so now he's teaching everybody how to do this properly. It's a Good. Was that the guy you're gonna bring today that you showed me the video of? You shit sent me a video on your phone there. That guy? That's him? No, it was the guy. I the phone. Okay, he's hardcore. That guy. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, cool. Um, Ethereum. A lot of people don't know what the point of that one is and who it is and stuff. But we'll go fast. But Ethereum is the is an amazing product, it's an amazing uh, coin, it's an amazing project, it's still growing, it's got offshoots like crazy. It is the backbone highway for smart contracts and blockchain programming, it has given birth to a ton of opportunities and a ton of coins. And in the old days, companies like oil and gas would start an IPO and get all their friends and family buying shares and doing all that, well Ethereum provides the, the, the coin that all you see, the ICOs and IEOs and SCOs and all the names they got today, Ethereum is pretty much the starter. Uh, starter backbone capital that all these things start from. They go in a token and then they go from token to coin and they do this maturity thing and all that kind of stuff. So Ethereum is a very powerful piece of the crypto puzzle. And if Bitcoin is the, uh, is the Coca-Cola, then Ethereum is definitely the Pepsi, right? And it's right there with it all the time, right? And it was developed by a Canadian, uh, Russian uh, kid, smart guy, super smart, Vitalik, you guys can study him. And uh, Ethereum is probably the neatest interesting uh, crypto coin that was ever invented at its time. Now there's so much else since then, but it is still a mainstay in the, in the system and it is a true uh, exchange of value. And what that means is that you can go with Ethereum, you can go on the internet, you can go to some of these websites like here, Brave New Coin, Coin Exchange, Yobit, all these ones, and you can buy opportunity. You can buy further uh, altcoins with Ethereum. It's just about as powerful as Bitcoins. It's down close. Is it going up at the same rate? Uh, it does move around at the same velocities, you bet. And, and at different times too, at different things too. So you'll see, you'll see them kind of moving, but, but overall, yes. And I, I could show you guys some charts in a minute. There's a lot of similarities. A lot of these guys have seen that. Uh, but there's a lot of similarities between all the coins, the majority of altcoins and Bitcoin, right? Recently, Bitcoin's uh, uh, inflation has been rising way faster than uh, the market cap now? Uh, right now, we're at uh, 138 trillion, billion. Yeah, 138 billion. Okay. 138 billion. So it's probably, and that's just Bitcoin, okay? And then but the whole market is what? Yeah, we're at 246 okay. billion right now, which is huge because, like, just months ago we were at 97 billion, right, and stuff like that. So we're at, we're at a, a quarter of a trillion dollars right now, just at a quarter of a trill, and that's big. We've, we've, we've doubled and a bit more since, since, since just the months ago, since I got back from Mexico till now, just so you know, it's March, right? So that's a big, that's a big jump in a little while. Even my Bitcoin, you, you can look where you want, but I think I've seen about a 30% plus increase in my value in the last month or so here and stuff, so it was really nice. So now the asset manager is saying they need to put 2% of the portfolios in, in crypto now. They're saying that as advice, 2% of your portfolio? Neat, that's Fidelity who, Ma management? Took like 100 trillion under management. Yeah, I saw that they're coming out uh, with their own paper <laughs> Bitcoin too and stuff. So some of you guys should be careful of some of those things too because some of the things that those funds are doing, they're not real Yeah, that's true. They're, they're not. Just, they're just you're buying money. like a paper on a wager against the crypto, yeah. right, like in that sense. So you gotta be very careful what you're buying out there. And a lot of the traditional people that we don't, that aren't here tonight, we'll just say, they're not here tonight, are looking at you know their mutual funds and things and thinking of crossing over into that kind of you know mechanism. It's not the same mechanism that we're dealing with here. Just is, so you know is that. There right? is, there is there ETFs trading? Is there what? Is there ETFs that are trading? You know why it's good? no, not here. Why the last little a little run up was like a little mosquito on the back of a bull. The bull is coming, and it's because they're insuring anybody who puts money in crypto firms are insuring oh, yeah. the principal. Oh yeah. It's going to be a tidal wave among the trillions of dollars in the United States. And that's what we're hoping. And then, I don't know, about four months back, I had a PowerPoint sent from this uh, from this uh, finance guy in Greece. And this guy from Greece, uh, you were here then, I think you were here, Neil. And I had this PowerPoint. It was rough English. It was weird looking. Uh, but basically, he said in this thing, he says, when, when the marketplace, we're at a quarter of a trillion, he said, when we get to one trillion, everyone's going to wake up at a certain level of economy and people are really going to start to move in. You'll see the floodgates open. And when we get to five trillion dollars, it'll be 
fully vested and incredibly institutionalized, and all the big players will be in at this point, right? And at five trillion, the world is gonna make a major, major financial changeover. So if you wanna count with me, because we're all here, we're doing this for five years, right? So you wanna, and we're only, what, a year and a half into this? So five year plan, we're watching this thing. If this, if this does what it says it's gonna do, right? We're gonna see it go from a quarter trillion to, to let's say five trillion, and we'll be here to watch all that and engage. Yeah. And, and, and this well, we know the fake news now. Oh, don't worry about that stuff. There's going to be all kinds of heists and news and all kinds of drama because anything that has value, there's all that stuff circulating around it. You know how this works, right? Value Look at the dollar, right? It hasn't been done. Exactly. It's new, new frontier. So let's look at the chart for a minute. Today we're down five points, uh, five percentage points on Bitcoin today, which is fine. It's still ranked number one as usual. The last 24 hour volume has been at $31 billion. So that's a nice little number, $31.9 billion. Um, Let's see who the biggest markets are. Lately, it was Bitmex. They were still wagering. So you, you, yeah, it is. So a lot of you gamblers out here, and we are in the Cowboys Casino. And again, I'm giving zero gambling advice either. But on Bitmex, <laughs> you get 100 to one your Bitcoin, and they're it's like credit, and it gets dangerous if you do the shits. So, so, but they will leverage you 100 to one. Okay, if you if you deposit in your account, they'll 100 to one you at Bitmex, and then you can play the game, and you can go after the opportunities, the lifts, the coins, and stuff like that. I know Matt's back here. He's always asking me, Jan, you know, what's a crypto side hustle? Well, that's one of them. You don't have to go 100X uh, on it, either 10 or whatever. You can go less, right? You can just 5X your Bitcoin and then play like that. So you can, I think you can control your amount of damage, you know? But, uh, but they do it, and they're the only ones that do it really well, and then that, you can short Bitcoin. But right now we're on a bull run, so that, that's not gonna work, you understand? So it's different, but they, there's a lot of economy that's made in BitMEX uh, in particular. And again, you, some of you are new and all that, I just wanna explain. BitMEX is an exchange house, and it is a place where the coins go into there, you send your Bitcoin values in it, and then you buy other altcoins, and you wager, and you do other things, stops and, and shorts, and things like this, and different moves in there, okay? Yeah. Yeah. No fees, they don't charge anything? Uh, they do and they don't, but uh, it just depends. Like, there's no fees if you do Bitcoin with USD specifically. Uh, Make sense? Yeah. So if you if you put your US cash into their company, <laughs> I mean, they love it. they're happy. No fees. Bring it in, right? You get it? Makes I sense. know you get it. Yeah. Smart. And then they're like, yeah, buy Bitcoin with all the US cash you got. <laughs> Wire it in, right? Like, just think about these guys. They're damn smart. And not only that, I want to show something else. Like. You know, we see all this brand hogging and all that stuff, but these guys are holding 11.2% of the marketplace. If you guys at your shipping company you work for held 11.2% of the marketplace, you guys would be doing better, right? You know that. So that's a big, big chunk of the pie, right? And, and so on. And the next guy down is 5% of the market, and that's some, that's Negosi Coins, which is really a weird one. I don't even know what the BRL is. Does anyone know what the BRL is? It's new on here. Brazil. So it looks like Brazil has taken the second spot in the Bitcoin markets, which is new, ladies and gentlemen. Break that one down. We've never seen that before. So now the, if you use a Brazilian dollar, whatever it is, against the Bitcoin here, um, this is one of the biggest traders right now. They're half of, of what BitMEX is doing. They're 2.2 uh, billion right now out of Brazil. And so a lot of people discount South America. They think they're poor people and all these things. They say that. And there's a, a big variance between the poor people to the rich there. It's a, it's a, a greater spread, right? They say that. But, but this proves to me that they're still a very powerful people overall, and they've got money to blow and spend, and they wouldn't be putting it into crypto if they didn't, right? And if a, if, a, if a one section of the world could take over what is now the number two spot in, in transactions, that's pretty cool too, and you love your Costa Rica. There's a lot of fans in this room of, of Latin America, right? And, 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 and he goes down there all the time, and I can't wait till you send us, hey, I bought my beer here with Bitcoin or whatever, or crypto or whatever. I know you're gonna send me that one day, right? Um, Coinbene, Chinese company. Um, what do they say in there? U.S. dollars, they're way down, not way down farther, but they're 3% of the market, which is still huge. Uh, Coineal, OX, and what I'm seeing here is a lot of other players have bounced up to the top ranks here. So the Bitcoin markets are going through some changes. There was a day when Binance was like number one and two all the time. You know, it was BitMEX and Binance kind of slugging it out for those spots. Um, IDAX was in there, that was a big player there. Hooboy was in there. Hey, you've seen all these other guys before, but it's interesting to see now all these other players worldwide are getting in there. So when I see Brazil today, just as an analyst of week-to-week -week stuff, just, just generally, um, I'm a little bit surprised, but not shocked. I think that's fabulous. I think that's, this is, the world is changing right now. So like the game of risk, you just lit, we just lit up that chunk of Brazil right now, and now it's, it's game time. So it's exciting. And as we see more and more countries light up, we'll see South Africa take a big chunk of this too, and other places, and you guys will see a lot more changes in the near future here. It's gonna be exciting.
stuff like this makes me really happy. Except for that coin meal one. Look, it was the only one that had white coin in the pair. Yeah, yeah. So, so pairs are this too. So uh, again, starter capital is any kind of money, right? And then you either get it through a broker like myself or a trader or whatever you do and go through a website. There's many options to get it. But once you have your Bitcoin, you can go into the web and, and, and put it into different markets. And it's very exciting, right? And, and, and that's what Kevin's saying. So, so some of them say, well, you can buy it with Litecoin. So what they're saying is that you can use other cryptos that you have in stock. Because a lot of people go and buy a, a project and, and fall in love with it and they'll hold on to it. And then they'll sit on it and then they want to do something else with it. And that's where those other websites come into play because you can trade your Bitcoin uh, for other stuff or Litecoin story for Bitcoin and things like that. Here's Bitcoin's ROI tonight. I love going over stuff like this. We're at 5,684% okay, on the ROI. No. And I challenge anybody in this room, you know, show me on your phone right now something else you bought outside of crypto that had a number like that. Anything? 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 Look at all the no's. Nothing! Okay, that's what I thought. All right, so market cap, 138 billy. It's big bossing. It's going heavy. Total supply right now is 17 million Bitcoin. We're going to how many, how many million, Kevin? 21. There you go. So we're at 17 million on the street, and we're only going to 21. And like I said, when it halves here in the coming year, it's going to shrink the value. And then we're going to supposedly have another 100 years before we tap it out. That's the weird thing about it. That's the weird thing about it. So people don't know that. But after this next halving, it's going to take 100 years possibly from 2022 to 2122 to actually deplete that last bit of, the, of, the, of that, what's left to the 21 million. Because every four years it be halved. Exactly. Every yep. Four. Every four years. So it's going to be exciting, you guys. You'll see this. Jay, what does that mean exactly, the habit? Well, the algorithm gets harder. Yeah. It gets harder to solve, so the mining uh, gets harder to do, right. and the computers have to catch up to that, and it also slows everything down another huge notch, half, like it halves half. everything. Yeah. It halves the output, it halves the income coming from the mining of it and the, and, and the, uh, the nodes, right? Okay. So and everything that, halves. And that's expected to affect the value or the supply? It, it, the supply will, will continue to kind of, you know, continue to trickle out, right? Yeah, so but it does affect the supply, yeah. absolutely, because it starts to shrink that. It, it's it's like a reverse funnel. Right? It's going yeah. from the fat side down to the skinny so, side right now, right? In an easy and that's way, what's happening. In an easy way, if it right now takes like $50 million in electric power to find a block in Bitcoin, you get 100, let's say, this is not real numbers, you get 100 Bitcoins when you find a block. Yeah. So when you get halved, now it'll only be a reward of 50 Bitcoins but the same amount of electric power is going to be used to mine that Bitcoin. So theoretically, what happens when something, you get half the reward, but have to use the same amount of energy to, to get that resource? What happens to that resource's value? But isn't there, there going to be more uh, capable machines, solid state, faster machines, technology, like yes. during that time yes. to make yep. up the difference? Yes. Well, but you can't, you can't mine, stepping up now? Yes, yeah, you can't mine Bitcoin beyond a certain pace. So only a certain amount of blocks are released by speed. So even when ASICs first came out, yeah. that's the resistance that Bitcoin's built to prevent anyone from basically mining the existence of Bitcoin in one second. Correct. It prevents it so you can only mine to a certain speed, which is why, for instance, Bitcoin had certain peaks a day to get a transaction oh, okay. instead of five minutes. That's the mechanism okay. to secure people from trying it's to- valve. It's valve. It's valve algorithmically. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. Big words, funny words, but yeah, it's valve. I read an article too where or after the halving, uh, including the increase in energy as well, but it's going to be about $16,000 per Bitcoin. Nice. Well, during the last halving was... 16000 I believe it was the last... Yes. The last okay. halving was right prior to the bull rush of 2016. 16 grand to generate one Bitcoin is going to be massive. Right? Was that the last... That was... Yeah, the last halving was right before everyone probably heard of Bitcoin. Right? That big bull rush? That, right. The last halving was like six one months or something prior time. to that. And the rewards at that time were 25 Bitcoin. So in 2016, when it happened, it went down to 12.5. And then next year, when it happened, it was 6.25. So in eight years, it went from 24 to 6.25. Guaranteed. Less Bitcoin, more value. Scarcity. So. I always jump onto the page called Recently Added on CoinMarketCap, and uh, I like to check this page out a lot. It tells you what has come out of the marketplace that's been a, a valid entry into the, into the exchange world and, and things like that. And it's a good place to shop for deals, and it's a good uh, place to shop for lift on your money. 
I'm going to explain a little bit of how you could make a lift happen by buying into something like this for a second, and you guys will get the idea. Put those things in there. Okay. If everyone can see um, the second one down here on the screen, it's called Fab. Okay. The symbol is Fab. Fabulous. It's fast action or fast access blockchain. Okay. It just came out one day ago. I knew about the project before. I saw it on another list before that, that it was coming, and there's different nodes and stuff releasing. Um, it just released one day ago, and the, and the value of it's already at six cents. And mm -hmm. Kevin knows how, and, and same with Corb, that they know that that's fast. Like we don't get to six cents that fast because if you look at the one right above it, we're at you know three millionth of a satoshi there at the query coin, and that's you know millionths of a penny uh, of value right above it, right, and come out in the same day. And the volumes and sales are the same too in the 24 hours, so they're in there. So right away, you, you as a as a as a potential you know, a, a trader in this in this world of, uh, of crypto, you would want to be checking out Fabcoin, and you want to find out what's making that tick and, and why, and, and if you should get all over that. Okay. And an example, because everyone always asks me, how do you make the money doing this, right? So here's how you would you would see this came out one day ago. You see it's at six cents right now. You would take a certain amount of budget of Bitcoin that you have in your in your in your wallet in your in your account, and you you go to the exchange where this thing is available. And you purchase that. Let's, just, let's do thousand dollars for a second. So you just buy a thousand dollars worth of Fab with your Bitcoin, and then as Fab starts to race, because it just came out a day ago, now their marketing and their advertising and their PR is going to go around the world. China's going to get a hold of it, South Korea, all these places, and you'll probably see this coin because with this kind of results of coming out at six cents, it's already got so much more velocity than, than, its, than its competitors. So this is that's why this is the one to watch. So now you're gonna see this thing probably go from six cents maybe to 56 cents, and I don't know that at all. I'm not even saying it will, but that's the kind of idea, and, and that's the kind of moves that I look for. So I'm always looking for this kind of deal right there because that's something small that you can jump in with a small amount of money and you can extrapolate big gains off of that if it works out for you, just saying, right? And, and I also wanna say this, because I was talking with some, some investors this week and things, all of this stuff is so risky. All of it is so, so risky, and, and people are, are weird out there, and there's a lot of weirdos and just things, but just keep that in mind. And, and I also want to say this too, is that like I bounce in and out of these things. Like I don't really stick around for the drama. I don't really hang around for the ship to go down. I don't really care you know, what, if the CEO gets all this money and then goes on drugs and spends it all on cars and motorbikes and you know, scotch and stuff. None of that stuff impresses me. Like, and I'm I'm allowed to like you know make money doing an investment, you know, with my money, with my money, right? So I don't I don't want to be partake of any of that junk. So so what I try to do is get in and I get out as quick as possible. I try to take what I call a reasonable uh, action, a reasonable lift. I'm not greedy. I don't go in there and try to sit around for 200% if it's not coming. You know, I take my 20% and I bounce, right? So keep that in mind. I feel like a lot of you that are new to this space too, sit there and kind of hold your shit in one pile or whatever, and don't, move it around, right? Move it around, uh, buy, buy some other opportunities, learn more about the space, because if you don't do that, you're just, you're not gonna get, you know, what the juice is all about, right? Yeah, exactly, you, you, gotta, you gotta get the juice though. And again, right, just like we always said, if you buy a coin, you see it's about 20, 25% percent it's not half of it. Yeah, you can sell half of what you got. Get so your money do, back. Do you move it into your wallet? Then out of that you do. wallet, you go back in. There. Good question. So, so how would that work? Even better than that. So Fab's there. Okay, I got my I got my thousand dollars. I'm gonna buy Fab at six cents. Okay, so I go and I move my funds into the exchange where it's available because it'll tell us in a minute. I'll show you how to find that. So we go to the exchange, which is the website. I've signed up. I've logged in. I've given my driver's license because I'm doing money. It's okay to do that. Don't give your passport, but definitely give your driver's license. So I move my 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 Bitcoin into the exchange from my wallet and my phone. It's now there, I got my thousand bucks worth. I go and I buy my uh, Fab coin, I buy a thousand dollars worth of it. Now it's there, now by f uh, Thursday next week, it goes up and my thousand dollars is now three thousand dollars, example. Sure. Now I sell it back inside the exchange, same software, same website, I log back in and I take Fab coin and I go to the market inside there and I sell it. And I sell it at the ask rate right now. Yeah. And then bam, and when I sell it, it puts it back in my Bitcoin wallet with the profits, yeah. right? Yep. So that 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 thousand dollars is now three thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. So that's the that's the that's the money. That's the juice, right? That's the move, right? And then and then you can keep doing that. You can keep doing this because because I got friends that have been doing this for a year and a half, eighty-seven weeks in a row. Eighty-seven weeks in a row, so, so shopping you, for pennies, turning them into dollars, and rolling like that. And that's their whole focus. And and they when, win. And when you want to go back out, these are all available. You bet. Yeah. yeah. So Sorry, there is one thing to say though. Go ahead. If you want to go on Google, there's market books just like stocks. Not sure if anyone knows.
as those, but there's market books and liquidity with every coin as well. As you can see under the 24 hour volume, it's super crucial that you always make sure there's someone on the other end willing right, to buy it. the amount you're willing to sell. So if you even Google it, someone lost $400,000 last week yeah. in Pivx because they were buying at market price, but they decided instead, do I'm willing to buy all for 400,000, just clear the order book, whatever, I want my coins now, and they pay 15,000% higher. 15,000% right. higher. Than what they should have. Yeah, So that's a donkey move. We don't do that, do we? Yeah, so that's why you always gotta make sure. <laughs> always like ask experts if you're gonna do trades do to that. like, Make sure you're that, doing. That's because he didn't put a separate. It was it was a small coin. He was wanting to buy. You know, it was a penny yeah. coin, like he was saying. The volume per hour was five thousand. He bought four hundred thousand at once. So it cleared literally anyone's trade that was there for probably Just the past value. two years sitting. Oh, and they were really bad prices, right? There was yeah. probably a saturation of you know twenty thirty thousand yeah. dollars thick, and then the rest was thin. So they yeah. just blew it all out, and it was. They so can't so if you're them. selling them, can you put your like? Let's say you had you have thousands. You can see the market books. No, so no, but if you. If you can you just put in some donkey orders and yeah. just leave you can. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I you know can. some people that always throw in donkey orders and that's, I've seen at least four yeah. times now that if you would have had a donkey order on a certain coin, mm -hmm. you would have you would have cleaned $10, up. $10,000. Just because somebody entered wrong. Uh, and yeah, because yeah. yeah. someone yeah. does it wrong, you would have cleaned up on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But you gotta shop around. That's almost another point too, you gotta shop around because you got different yeah. people selling it's, in different exchanges. It's sometimes right? why a lot of people- And different people are different donkeys yeah. in different exchanges. Some and people, then you take advantage, right? Yeah, a lot of people like to have a crypto manager because then you just don't make those mistakes, right? It's, it's, it sounds like a bad mistake, but I've seen so many people do it that it's a $5,000 mistake that- You know guys, we're gonna bounce a little further down. I just wanna show you some other stuff because he's onto the numbers with us and he sparked another thing in my head. <laughs> Circulating supply. So as we come down four days old, Swift cashes out and Swift's big. You guys can write that one down. Swift, S-W-I-F-T. 86 you know, million circulating supply already, and that's fast. And we're still well below a penny here, and we got a market cap already of 315,000. So when I'm, when I'm eagle eye, you know, Jan, and I'm looking for what I'm looking for, this is another one that stands out to me, Swift Cash. So I go, I go research this even further, and I find out what I should be doing here, and I, I might want to take a position. And furthermore down, eight days ago, IDEX came out on the market, we're already at 8.6 million, we're already at four cents. So we could have made some serious lift at day one. So I just want to show you the difference here. So imagine with me backward, we're already at four cents and we go backward to where you see some of these where it's like, you know, uh, a, a millionth of a penny kind of thing. So, so these guys have already in eight days gone up to four cents. And if you're back here at a millionth of a penny with your thousand dollars, then you are up here somewhere around 10,000, hundred thousand dollars kind of thing when it gets up to here. So that's the, that's the lift. It's, it's massive. Okay. So, so see that, okay? And that's the stuff you wanna look at. So eight days ago, some people did really well on this. And, and if that much transacted, which is not a lot, that's an average of a million something, a million 1.1 a day or something, it's still enough velocity like he was looking for to make this some sort of a, a better play than maybe some of the other ones is all you wanna see. see. Some of the other ones are shittier and not so good. This is something that's got some merit and this one's blowing up, okay? And again, this chart is available every day to you guys. This is on coinmarketcap.com and it is called uh, the new releases, okay? And it's in the menu there. Pay attention to this. And, and I, I talk about this a lot, but I'm, not, I'm gonna bounce now out of here. Do you wanna say something else, Daniel? Maybe yeah, I just scroll up, there's something that's really interesting up there that I didn't, if you notice. Cool. It's uh, Thundercoin. Yeah, I saw so that, it came, out, it came on the market seven days ago and it's 24 hour volume is $23 million. Yeah, yeah, I know. So it's, imagine a, a stock getting $23 million in volume. TT. So break that one down too. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I just need to check it out. That's the highest volume <laughs> by it's fifty times the volume of any other. They're new. We haven't right? seen it. Something's going on. Yeah, but something's this is where we're going fishing, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is where you throw. Perfect. That's where you research, research, research on the news, right? If there's good news or bad news. If it's a hey, you got you got to pay to play, right? That's how it works out there. So next one I go to is gainers and losers, and that's on the more mature movement of such. So this is a this is a nice little indicator of how the market's going. So I like to balance the seven day uh, things, and this is when you know my, my brains explode, okay? And when I see stuff like this, I can't even imagine. So right now, Blue Whale Exchange came out of the market with their own in-house uh, IEO, the BWX coin. You can see that it's already at 15 cents, and it's had 9,000% plus growth increase in seven days. So this company, it's a company, Blue Whale Exchange is just like another exchange like Binance. They come out with their in-house token, BWX, they blew the doors off some sales. They're at 15 cents already, and they've given their investor or holders, we'll call them holders, uh, over 9,000% lift. I missed that one. I'm mad right now. I like that stuff. The next guy down from there, let me finish, 290%. 
So we're still in the love zone. Clipper coin, CCX is 275%. Matic Network was 221%, GMV 203%, Bit White was 156. I'll stop there for a sec. BTW, BTC is Bitcoin. I usually buy coins in all of the Bit family, so you know that, and, and I like them. And I've got the Bitcoin Diamond. Hey, come on in. Hey, Welcome back. Yeah. I, I buy Bitcoin Diamond. I buy Bitcoin Gold and a whole bunch of Bitcoin Green. So you guys know that, okay? Um, okay. What else is on that there? Memes, there's an actually big one. Meme is a blockchain that's enterprise based, so it's been around for 10 years and it's up 88% the past seven days. Yeah, NEM? Yeah, and that's a huge, that's a big yeah. blockchain. Oh yeah, I own, that, I own some of that. Number 19 there, NEM, and the symbol is XEM for you listening. We're already at 99 million in the 24 hour volume, up 88%. All of these, okay, ladies and gentlemen, this whole sheet. Right there, that whole page down to 30. Look at that. The lowest guy on the totem pole is a 74% increase in your money in seven days. The lowest guy on the list. Okay? Then again, go to the top spinners at 9,000%. And again, I'm mad. I missed this one. This reminds me of that Medicoin. Medcoin, I missed that too. And it spun off like that. It was gigantic. And then if you want to dial it back, you can hit the tabs up there. All these websites also for the noobs, they all act like spreadsheets. So you can sort based on the titles here. They'll sort for you, they'll give you the highest amounts, like you can do it here. So Matic Network had 58 million in the last 24 hours, man. Matic, M-A-T-I-C, that's insane. And it had a 14% lift in its economy for you. So it's huge, it's really huge. So back to uh, percentage-wise, the top dog of the week uh, in 24 hours, the last 24 hours has been GMB coin, HQX coin, and they're both at over 100%. And then carrot gold, carrot gold is up, ladies and gentlemen, seven and a half cents uh, USD. Crazy. Boys, see that? So you guys like that? Uh, Fifty-four percent increase right now. And I, when, what was our highest on carrot gold that we saw? Was it eleven Twelve. cents? We got to eleven or so. Twelve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that a carrot bar thing? Yeah, that's the carrot bar one. Oh, yeah. The one that Nick's all crazy about and all that. Huh. And that company came up with another coin called KCB after, right? So they were trying to do another big buy in on their bullshit stuff and all that. And that's fine, like they're, they're a business and they're trying to make it out there and everyone has their little opinion and stuff. But really at the end of the day, like Kevin and I talk about all the time, we, we don't give a shit who the CEO is. We don't give a shit you know, what their name is. We don't give a shit about a lot of those other things that everyone's giving a shit about. We give a shit about making money. So, you know, if we can't make money with this asshole CEO or whoever he is, then we don't care, right? We're, we're bouncing, we're out of here, right? Who cares? So run the company, run the software, run the idea, run the mission, run the play, run the blockchain, transparent, beautifully, do what you say you're gonna do, make us all money, and, and we're behind it, right? If not, we're bouncing and we're going to another project because there's only like two or 3,000 to choose from. You to rebuy my right? Only, like, oh, yeah. So it's like, oh my God, we have nothing to choose from, right? So yeah, amazing. Look at that. Okay, I told you guys about Bitcoin with the double I. I don't know how long ago. We gotta listen back. Bitcoin with the double I came out at nothing, nothing, Kevin. Right now it's thirty-four cents. It's still fucking climbing. It's Bitcoin with two eyes, and it's been going up. I don't know how long now. Sneaky. It's like a stupid spelling error, you know? And, and, and it's it's rocking. And again, it's a shit coin. Let's say. Let's just call it that. But it's how long making money. Uh, it was a little while ago, man. But not that far. This is here. Huh? No, I didn't make my. I want to make a pasta coin, like for pasta, like spaghetti and all that. I think it's huge. Okay, so. Well, they made the beer coin. They've already made a pizza coin, so you know. They made a burger coin. They made a lot of stupid shit already. It's out there. It's out there. Dan! Hey, man. How are you? Um, 34 cents right now on the B2G, which is really cool. Yeah, we'll go to market. So I want to see what's selling here. So X Rates has got the biggest volumes on it, 312,000. And then DigiFinex, LA Token, CoinBene, CoinAle, and a few other ones in their stacks. Yeah. They're all mostly paired with BTC. So people are spending their hard earned Bitcoin on this coin. But they're buying the lift, and I know why, right? So it's, it's what's happening. So it's cool. But Bitcoin with two eyes, who knew, right? Maybe uh, you want to see me sit on that edge. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure.
wants to sit with me. No one wants to sit with you. Okay, um, let's go. So I wanted to show you that. I think we're good there. I think we covered enough stuff today. So real quick, we have 2,182 semi-legitimate coins listed on the coin market cap. I say semi because nothing's guaranteed, okay, but it is good stuff. They do their diligence of some kind. There's 18,422 markets out there now. So that, that was peanuts in the past. It wasn't even 1,800. And now we're 18,000 market place out there. The market cap's almost at a quarter trill. We're excited about that today, ladies and gentlemen. We're making gains. The crypto world's expanding. We're at 244 billion. And the 24 hour volume has been 112 billion, so it's really nice. Bitcoin's dominance has also risen, Daniel. We were at, last week, at, we were guessing the past was like 51%, 52. Yeah. We're sitting at 56.6, so that's yeah. pretty cool yeah. too. We've had to, to gain a whole crypto market dominance of even 4%, only imagine how much power that has to be, right? A velocity and stuff like that. Um, we, the one thing we didn't look at was the Bitcoin chart real quick. And then I'm gonna switch to some uh, special guests. So let's have a look here. Yeah. All right. The chart should be just, you know, bullish as fuck, and it is. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at that end piece there, right? You see it? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's just drill into um, seven days here. I think that's when all the sauce has been happening. <laughs> One month. You don't see that every day. It's very hard for us. Three months. Well, that's a fun fact. You should also mention the yeah. volume is higher this past 24 hours yeah. than it ever has been in the entire life. Yeah, there you go. So even during that 20,000 rush, more yeah. people are buying today than then. The volume wow. of the last 24 hours has is, is, is been more than any other time on Earth right now, today, wow. in Bitcoin. So congratulations for coming yeah. on too. That's why we got so many peaks even tonight. The energy's up, right? It's, it's, it's brewing. So there you go. It's on a constant uplift. You can see it just, just ripping up here. Started down here, small market cap, and it's just grown huge. Like It looks like it's almost tripled itself in market cap. It, it has, yeah. No, almost, almost. So it's close, but yeah, it's it's, it's still gaining pace. And, uh, and it's exciting times. It's exciting times in the whole crypto space right now. And a lot of people bought in in a high rate because that's what I think a lot of our neighbors and everybody came out of the woodwork and brought that you know, cash they had under the, under the pillow and stuff like that, under their mattress. And they bought all of this crypto at a high high point of its cost, right? So there's a lot of people right now that are just excited as hell to see this stuff start to climb because they've been waiting. They've been waiting yeah. a long time. So that's why I like it. The energy's going to flip and, and everything's going to move into another thing. Um, what was that crazy French guy's name, Paul something, that they said was the, the, the Bitcoin Paul LaRue? No, I think so. Yeah. Satoshi? Did you guys hear that? Seriously? Yeah, some crazy worldwide gangster was named <laughs> as the possible programmer guy for Satoshi. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. No way. I'll show you guys. Let's see this for a second. I always want to touch down some crazy news for once. This is good. Okay. So Satoshi Nakamoto oh, shit. could be criminal mastermind Paul LaRue. Okay? And after tonight, you guys go do your own homework. Dan can help you because he's a big internet sleuth. Research guy. He'll, uh, he'll research the shit out of it for us or with us. But, uh, but, but anyway, I, I read this already. I'll just fast track it for y'all. Wow. Um, there's Paul now. He is a, he is a man that, uh, that oh. was originally creating software in his early days um, that, that did cryptography. And, and we're, like, Bitcoin came out, blockchain came out in 2008, the whole style of it. 2009 was when Bitcoin was released to the world and, 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 and started its you know, journey. It was January 3rd, 2009. Yeah. And then, uh, and then prior to this, in the 90s, this man right here, Paul, was already doing cryptography. He was already taking a file folder of sensitive data, encrypting it, and then sending it to your buddy, right? He had a software that you could download on your PC, Windows, uh, you know, Windows 1, you know what I mean, or Windows 92, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and put that little patch code on there, and you could actually encrypt your file folders on it. And Paul had invented that, and CIA, and just all kinds of crazy institutions took his software and made it their baby, and he became famous. And then later he worked on the other side of the fence trying to like hack the hackers because he was a smart guy. And then overall he got into crime and you know, crime had the bigger paycheck. So he went there. And uh, he is, uh, they're claiming that he has a lot to do with this. And even his name, he had a fake passport that had a similar Satoshi. That's him as a young boy. He had the hockey hair just like, uh, who was it? Darcy. Darcy had that hockey hair. That's a bad picture of him. Man. And that shaker knit sweater from Eaton's. Remember that? That was in the catalog. Eaton's. Oh, yeah. And the sweats like that, they don't wear them like that. Now they're skin tight, the sweats, right? All the boys wear the skin tight sweats. Um, 
Here we go. So his last name, Smatoshi Calder LaRue, right, Paul? Really? <laughs> this is some fake passport from the <laughs> Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, but he still made that name up, basically. <laughs> of course he did, yeah. dude. So that's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence, I'd say. So the E4M website was archived as a manifesto stating that the governments are increasingly relying on electronic data, correct? Uh, <laughs> anyway, he went on to talk about preserving civil liberties, which he's a big advocate of at the time, because that, yeah. that was the movement. Um, but anyway, so 10 things that, that point to the remove uh, building Bitcoin. Here's the fun stuff, so let's get into it. So number one, the curious Satoshi, Solotoshi monikers. Uh, number two, both were programmers familiar with C++, and that's really the standard code of programming. Number three, both had strong interest in cryptography and privacy. Wow. Number four, both were very wary of authority. Number five, both had interest in online gambling. Bitcoin's initial code had a poker client included. Interesting. Wow. Number six, both were well aware of the difficulty with traditional payment systems, LaRue on account of the illegal prescription drug racket he was running. So there you go. Number seven, Satoshi's spelling and language, the way he spelled the word analyze, color, defense, bloody, hard, is consistent with the Rhodesian LaRue's. Huh. So there you go. So they're analyzing different emails that were going around from Satoshi. Satoshi disappeared in early 2011 to move on to other things around the same time that LaRue was transitioning from software genius oh. to cartel mob boss. Wow. Um, with tens, number nine, with tens of millions of dollars in cash, LaRue would have no need to cash out his bitcoins once the price began rising. So wow. he was already well fed with his cash. Yeah. And number 10, and if anyone could have hidden wallets containing one million bitcoins of them, oh, yes. not a yeah. million, Absolutely. It would have been the creator of disk encryption oh. software, TrueCrypt. He made TrueCrypt? That's him. Oh my goodness. See? Yeah. I was wondering what happened to that guy because he fell off the map in 2014. Uh, he well, just there you go, Broski. Totally totally he just might have made Bitcoin. Oh my How goodness. How about that one, computer nerds? This is, this is great. I'm going to have to write this down. <laughs> hey? Yeah. See? That's so that, happy. That's the TrueCrypt. So, okay. there you go. And then and there's, and Dan loves this shit. Oh, there's oh, yeah. some snippets <laughs> of the emails from Satoshi and stuff. Also yeah. definitely more about Silk Road and things like that. Oh, yeah, started, yeah, right? so yeah. Right? Yeah. I also felt uh, there's that drug and all that stuff because yeah. Silk Road was this uh, website that was developed by a Vancouverite, Man City boy. I can't remember his name, but I don't need to. Uh, and, uh, and he knew who Satoshi was because Bitcoin was the only currency that entire e commerce site transacted in. Wow. And it started like that because they didn't have uh, a way of selling credit cards that are stolen to people unless they had Bitcoin in those days, just so you know. And, and whatever they sold, it's like guns and, 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 and drugs and all these things. So, so it started very shady. It really did. And, and that guy from Vancouver, the, the oh, yeah. DEA put him in jail. He's in jail for life now. And, and the way you used to get to the Silk Road is you had to go on Wikipedia, and somewhere in the chapter of text, oh, really? one of the highlighted words that's there, you know, like a hyperlink underli underlined word, yeah. you click that and it fucking took you into this giant eBay website of the Silk Road. And Holy if you shit. didn't know what page in Wikipedia, under what topic, and what word, you were shit out of luck. And the word got around, and it was really interesting, and he moved it around all the time. So almost every day, he changed the article, the topic, and the key word throughout Wikipedia. Wow. So you got this giant <laughs> world encyclopedia of data, all this massive trillions of topics, and this dude is fucking moving this thing around the entranceway to the, to the dark side. Insane stuff. Trust me, man. It's amazing. That's great. So, after all that shut down, after all that criminal activity is over, all that drama is done, thank God. And now we move into the future where we are today, 10 years later, and Bitcoin's cleaned it itself up a lot. Yeah. This is a lot of reasons why you guys have seen the banks and everybody stay away, and they're not stupid too. Like they're, they're obviously evaluating the risks, you know? And with a bit of a torrent past like that, how can you blame them? I, I know clean business, and it's just not something they want to get into, right? Like, let's be honest, right? So. Yeah. So I get that. I get that all. And uh, and I wouldn't even be with Bitcoin today if it wasn't the cleaned up version that it is, by the way. Like I, I wouldn't want to be involved with any of that past stuff that they had. It's, it's all crap. Yeah. But but today still, let me say this, that they're still doing stuff illegally on the web. And it goes on in a thing called the dark web. Yeah. And there's another tool called an onion browser. And for those of you that like to you know go down the rabbit hole of you know, whatever, you can find that stuff out there. It's not secret to get it. But then you have to go find your way in the weird world of the underbelly, right? So yeah, that, that tread guy. safely, young peeps, tread safely. <laughs> so you can see uh, uh, that same uh, that same computer guy, he was stayed up 24 hours a day and he had a big cocaine yeah. habit. You can see this cocaine <laughs> storage here. They found this in his fridge. 
That's a lot. That's a brick. Each one. Yeah. This guy was staying up a lot. I don't think he was staying up. He didn't sleep, dude. And, and imagine what he would think the world's after him, eh? And just keep doing drugs. The world's after me. And he would, you know, just imagine the, the stress and the pressure and what oh, he's shit. doing. Insane. And if he really is Satoshi, that would be weird. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. So, is anyway, it, is this guy in jail right now? He's in jail. Yeah, they got okay. him locked up. Okay. Uh, they found him. They pulled him off some island somewhere. They got him in jail right now, okay. and he's, he's he's they're using him now. Uh, their, their their plan with him is, is a skeptical plan. I read this online. It's not the real kind. Again, this is no advice. You guys know this. Is, this is edutainment. Some of it can be bullshit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But their plan with him is to is to turn him back into revealing who all this is. And that's why Craig Wright yeah. was claiming that the world is going to see who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And that if you guys are keeping oh, up with this, okay. this is a big drama and a big deal. Okay. So so Craig Wright was supposed to announce this to the world. And a lot of that had to do with all of this going on as well. So, so I think the plans are foiled. I didn't see the big announcement. Did you, Kevin? There was yeah. no of him. It was that AI video from China. I saw that. It was bullshit again. It was bullshit again. The whole thing. Bullshit again. Like a deep fake video, basically. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So right now in China, what they're doing is they've made newscasters digitally, and they've sliced the face off, and then they put Mike's face on mine, and all of a sudden I've got his voice, and I'm doing something, and I'm saying words that he never said, and this is what's going on. So they they put a fake AI video out, and it's just going to get worse with stuff like that. Oh yeah. So you guys all be careful what you're reading. And believing out there too, please. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. Please. That's true. Uh, okay, I'm going to bounce out of this. Let's get our first special guest up here. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Mike, you're first. Yeah. Do you want me to switch laptops? Yeah. You have the cable? Okay, we are going to move to another little segment today. So tonight, your special guest first is Mike. He is here to talk about blockchain and the developments of it, and you guys can ask him questions later. Mike is a blockchain programmer by training, and he's also developing some really cool apps and already has. We have got some uh, stuff that he's been working on to show you guys. It's be prepared, it's very techy and very um, you know, electronic-y and geeky, so you guys will try to keep up. If you have any questions, I'll fill in. But um, we'll get to see the cool stuff. And we'll pass it around the room. We need some more room on this table. Okay. Yeah, whoever built TrueCrypt would probably have the technical skill to be a founder of Bitcoin, so that's, that was intriguing how that looked out. Yeah, sure. Mike, you get set up. Thank you. 
So our special guest number one tonight is Mike, and he is a programmer, and he eats and sleeps in digital code. He even has pajamas in the whole nine. He uh, doesn't even sleep much. He might be similar to that LaRue guy, but less cocaine and just more <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, he's make you see that guy's supply? Insane. Um, so, so what this young man has done, uh, first of all, he's uh, he's. he's Join my, my firm, which is called Brandworks Agency, for those that you don't know. Um, and what we do now, and there's a little flyer uh, proof that we went with Daniel and made, we program devices. So we can program a thing. Okay? We can make a thing talk to a thing. And it doesn't matter what it is. We can program a custom software. We can make an application. We can make a financial application. We can make an app. If any of you have the world's greatest app idea, let's go for coffee. Tell me, we'll sign an NDA, we'll make it. Let's make your baby, okay? We can make a DAP, a digital version, a blockchain version of an app. Okay? We can do a blockchain program. We can do a smart contract, which is an encapsulated database of data, and we can fire that anywhere it needs to go. Uh, we, can, we can run a factory now with blockchain as a software backend, and we have an egg producer by Lethbridge that's giving us a chance and a job to go down there and revolutionize their egg factory. Okay? We're going to print QR codes on the side of every egg that's the blockchain code. You're going to know every single one, and they're going to know how many, because they don't know. They never know every single day of production how many, ever. They don't. And they want to. And they want to be able to tell their suppliers what they can do, what it's coming, and all these things, right? So very interesting topic. So Mike, my man here, is going to show you something that he has made for agriculture. And one thing you all need to know is that agriculture is letting blockchain in first, okay? Because everyone right now, oil and gas, and medical, and everybody's got their door closed a little bit, which is a little peephole open, saying, hi, hi, Neil. What do you got there, blockchain? Okay, well come back in five years, okay? <laughs> come see us in five, we're not ready yet. Alberta Healthcare just got their shit together. So, so that's the problem, okay? So what's happening now is that we're going, we're, agriculture's letting us in, and we're gonna do this. So this is a, right now, the, this problem, because solutions, programming is always a problem. The problem is that farmers in Alberta get hit with hail and all kinds of other things that fuck them up and screw up their livelihood and their income. And they rely on insurance on reimbursing some percentage or total of that, okay? The issue is that the insurance companies can't necessarily send an agent out for any reason, on time. It takes time, it's a long time. And these people are you know, already behind their bills three, three months by the time they get out there. That's right. And then they dick them around because they can't prove it, okay? They can't prove it happened. And there's a lot of drama that goes along with everything in life. But this is one of the farmers are, are suffering. So this insurance company wanted a beta test done of how this could work and how they could track what's happening on the farmer's land. So now we go out with the internet of things and Mike's got all the sensors and valves and humidity and everything being tracked and we can see and we record what's happening with mother nature, what's happening to the crops and what's actually happening on that farmer's section of land and his four walls. And now we're tracking him with the blockchain address, we're tracking all the activity on his land with the blockchain smart contract uh, thing and if the humidity dips too low, a smart contract is generated and sent automatically to alert the insurance company. And guess what? Cool. Now, example, yeah. imagine the farmer's a little dishonest. He's got a section of land, but he tells him two sections got fucked, right? And I need money for that, right? They don't know. This is the big skeptical thing of it all. So now the blockchain's gonna send a smart contract for the exact amount and the real deal. And now it's valid and now they can trust it. And now they don't have to send a rep out. And now they know their farmer is legit. And now they pay. And now they stay in business, and it's just a, a beautiful thing. You get it? So go ahead, Mike. Show them. Yep. So uh, <laughs> I'm an uh, outside student at the uh, uh, Basically, what I've been doing for the past eight months is uh, really getting in with the uh, the um, department and just doing what's called applied studies. So basically, what I did was like I just spammed out like uh, emails uh, across the whole directory of the uh, ULEF, um just asking professors if I could work like with them in industry. Build different projects uh, based on like blockchain, 
uh, to address real world needs. And so I've been meeting with the uh, the AFSC, the, the Agriculture uh, Finance Services Corporation. Oh, yeah. uh, and so a big problem they had was uh, basically a lot of other money and time is spent uh, sending the physical person out to uh, uh, like a line claim if, if someone went wrong, uh, such as you know uh, like perhaps the temperature went too high, perhaps you know the bees were too cold or whatnot. Uh, and a solution for them could be uh, having these smart contracts, which is like uh, you know uh, programs built off of Ethereum or Hyperledger, uh, which could basically just automate the whole process based on sensors. Uh, and so then that's the whole thing we're looking through there. The only problem is uh, the, AF the AFSC they had kind of some shady stuff happen with their yeah with their executives. Uh, really? So yeah, uh, it was like back in 2015 or something. So the new government is uh, very wary of them, rightfully so. Uh, so they don't know if they're going to be able to do this kind of R&D stuff. But uh, since I emailed them out, they got a whole uh, R&D team looking at looking at the uh, like blockchain stuff. Uh, so one of the final projects I built was an asset tracker on blockchain. And so with this, it's kind of like uh, it's on the Ethereum blockchain. So uh, interesting thing with uh, kind of this like crypto stuff is that right now like the markets are kind of really irrational and stuff. So reading the white papers doesn't really matter. Yeah. But as the market matures, you're gonna have to start looking at the white papers and. Uh, understanding the actual technology behind the stuff. Uh, so I, yeah, I've been just, uh, you know, various professors just reading through the white papers and understanding the uh, the depth behind all these different types of cryptos or blockchains. Uh, so what this asset tracker can do is basically it monitors um, uh, temperature and humidity and then location too. I just don't have the GPS set for location. But uh, as you can imagine, like you simulate time across the whole supply chain. Uh, and then perhaps, you know, the temperature dips below a certain amount or, you know, humidity. I would kick out an error, and then from there you can cancel the order or continue. And so right now on uh, supply chain, uh, a lot of the supply chain uh, networks are kind of a black box. So uh, the example uh, Lethbridge, uh, uh, I was given Lethbridge was South, uh, South Alberta, uh, Southern Alberta is the leading export of hay for the majority of the world. Uh, and so one of the big problems was uh, they were exporting hay to South Korea it was. And so South Korea, the community is very high. So when you export hay to South uh, Korea, what ends up happening is um, they would let the hay sit in these like shipping docks for a long time. Yeah. It would grow mold in it, and so then uh, the problem with the mold is then they can collect insurance off of that. Then they just scrape off the three inches of mold, and from there, um, you know, they can just use the uh, hay again. And so that was because it was a very black box uh, process. But with uh, IoT and blockchain, what you can have, kind of having is a, a like a process monitor through the, the whole life cycle of the supply chain, and so you can know uh, if anything shady happened. And so then, yeah, I built out the uh, this is a simple like uh, humidity sensor, uh, temperature and humidity sensor on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and so then, you know, that was really quick there. I should tell people that. Um, and so then, you can also look at the analytics uh, throughout the whole process. This is tracking the temperature and this is tracking the humidity. Give me a pause for a second, just show you guys. Yeah. Right, you can come over after because we'll leave it on the floor. Right now, we have this micro micro PC processor called a Raspberry Pi. It's in my hand. This piece, this is a full fledged PC computer running here. It's similar, it's running on Linux, but it's a full fledged computer in my hand there. This is a little uh, circuit board that he's just using for Test Lab. So it's R&D, and he's he set up the, the, you know, the little uh, requirements. And this is a screen that keeps the monitoring going. And this would be just like in the uh, in the um, factory, right, of where, yeah. where this stuff is situated. So. They'd have screens and they'd have monitoring and they could find out all the data that they're looking for and it's all reporting on. So really cool stuff. And he's put all that together with just some of the you know the, the test lab tools and stuff like that. So come on over after and have a look. Go ahead. Yeah, great. And so yeah. uh, also uh, I won the uh, I won a blockchain hackathon uh, in Lethbridge. Oh, yeah. So it was the first one they had hosted there because uh, agriculture is basically supply chain and smart contracts. Uh, the big application of this is. Um, Anytime you have a large amount of throughput, so that could be like a supply chain of food, so that's why like they're trying to make a big ecosystem down there. Uh, so the hackathon was basically it was a six-week kind of like uh, business pitch and uh, coding competition. So we were up against a lot of like uh, graduate students, business students. We were kind of like this mangled up group of like we had an anthropology student, we had like a math ed student. So we were like, oh. it, was, it was very strange because we were kind of set up to lose, but <laughs> ended, up, ended up winning first uh, place in that. What we built was a um, it was a smart contract for. Um, uh, construction project management. So oftentimes uh, in the construction industry, we have is projects take too long and they go over budget. Uh, oftentimes, like the bigger government projects, they take a uh, minimum uh, a year longer than what they're supposed to and cost 50% more. Uh, so basically, we, w we had a way to track the inventory of all the items uh, coming in and out. Uh, and so then, the, yeah, the judges really liked that. We had some judges come from Toronto, all over Alberta uh, to watch the pitch. And so, yeah, that's, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, 
terms of blockchain stuff I've been doing. Well, the Dragon Den is next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, Do you track the amenity of the A right to Korea, like getting back to what you're saying? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Korea? Like is, so, so that device goes. Definitely. So it's, it's some of the routes. Yeah, sorry. You, you track, you track all the way. There's what's known as uh, edge computing, right? So a big problem with the IoT stuff right now is that um, if you imagine like just tracking something as simple as a humidity or temperature, you have to like ping up to the uh, the server like every once in a while. But with edge computing, what you do is you'd store all the data right on the device, and then once it would, you know, once so we're in, let's say we're in Lethbridge, you store all the information right onto the device. As soon as it ships to South Korea, then you can pick it up and then see if it's tampered with. And then, oh, okay. yeah, it saves yeah. money on just the networking, because that's a big problem with the uh, so so IoT. It's it just storing the data that uploads to satellite. Once it gets or, there. Do you, or do you program it like anomaly? Like, if it's, so if it's out of a certain range, then it fires so. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, as soon as it like it reaches a higher or low, just kick out and then yeah. let people know, yeah. But like, it, is it broadcasting in real time, or is it just waiting until it gets there before it uploads? So that could be, yeah, so that'd be the edge computing would be like, you wait till it uploads, yeah. and then, um, or you can broadcast with real time too. But then you're also paying for a satellite. Yeah. Which would be oh, so, so we upload to the satellite. So like yeah, you, 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 you do either, yeah. Yes, yeah, so for instance, like whenever there's a transportation dock or, or stop for, uh, oh, yeah. especially for semi trucks or for transportation for cargo and boats, you'll have certain docks and ports that you stop and record whatever's happening your weight, all that stuff. Yeah. Every single time they, that would be the send of data. So the timestamp of the past four hours, here's every second yeah. in the change yeah. in temperature and humidity during these seconds, and then upload and then yeah. on their way. So when you say device. So there's, a, there's what's known as Hyperledger too. So I guess it's kind of semi-related to other stuff here, but um, Hyperledger is kind of, it's a, it's a private blockchain. So like all this all this crypto stuff, it's a public blockchain. Anyone, anyone of us can join and start trading. Uh, private blockchains are invite only, right? And so uh, Hyperledger is purely a private blockchain without a coin. Uh, but what they're doing is a lot of like uh, B2B stuff. So they're doing a lot of uh, industry applications. So for example, uh, Walmart, there was that big scare with the, uh, the what was it, the romaine lettuce, right? Yeah, yeah. So it like, like I think like twenty two people got sick or whatnot, right? And it took like two or three months to track down. So with blockchain with Hyperledger, uh, Walmart was originally doing Hyperledger with their pork, uh, so they were tracking all the pork. But then after that uh, uh, romaine lettuce scare happened, they started tracking like they realized they had to track everything, right? And so what they were tracking, um, or what they're able to do with the uh, Hyperledger is they're able to uh, figure out where that romaine lettuce came from, the exact plot of land, in like uh, two to three seconds. And so oh, really? yeah, and so it does it damage the entire industry and. Uh, Consumer confidence is higher. Right, so, right. you know, you, you think back to the 1950s when uh, these kind of nutrition labels weren't on the food, right? So, there's a big shift happening in, um, in, in the consumer side where they want to know where their food's from. Uh, so, there's, you know, there's a lot of craft beer type, type companies. Uh, in Toronto, there's a company called Korean Discovery. There, a lot of agriculture companies are uh, implementing these early stage type technologies like blockchain. So it's definitely interesting stuff. Good job. Yeah. Good presentation. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah. Good work. You're onto something there. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, we'll wait to see where it goes next. Yeah. <laughs>
I, I just saw that in an article like yesterday. Yeah. I saw some pictures and it looked like he was going to be setting another car up again. Probably not because pretty expensive, but that was just a test. Well, no, I saw a car right in the middle there. I'm like, okay, is that going up with the spaceship again? Yeah. I'm going to show you this thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, I'll talk to you. Yeah. so uh so this is my second time here. Last time uh, I was talking about uh, some generation plants and stuff like that. Uh, this is my friend Steve, I'm Kyle. Hey guys. And uh, we don't really deal with the programming or Bitcoin or, or that kind of stuff, but we're the guys that actually build the plants and actually get the electricity to them. And we find out how to get the cheap electricity. Alright? So um, if you just want to talk about your company. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the uh, stuff we've been doing, um, I guess, crypto mining for starting three years ago now, the company, as we've been doing sites of, started with two, three thousand sites, two, three, two, three thousand miners in the building. Uh, we we're asked to just get started and uh, supply some generators and, hey guys, we need this up and running in a month. Um, so our first project was 3,000 miners and uh, it was all different types of miners, S9s, uh, L3s, I don't know them all actually. There's another guy that's supposed to present today, but I'm just going to There's no some background. But there's huge complexities with rushing a project and uh, these guys were quick to the market, wanted to go ahead and uh, uh, install 3,000 miners in, the, in a building. This is our first project. And so we went ahead and uh, designed and installed on the fly uh, 3,000 miners in the building. And we, uh, from that, we, we, we ran into discovering about HVAC and heat and uh, balancing of our uh, generators and our loads. And we ended up doing uh, uh, massive spreadsheets to balance all the different miners because they were all different. Uh, all the power supplies were different. So, you have, you have the end user that is, wants to put in 3,000 miners and they want to balance and pull out their miners and unplug them because, getting back to what you guys were saying, um, this one's not making money, this one is, I want to plug this one out, put this one back. And, um, or some were overheating. Uh, some were overheating, we had to do it with harmonic issues. Um, so when you go into the design, we designed the facility to accommodate uh, racks. We built racks of 200 miners per rack, and we probably had, you know, there's probably, call it 20 racks in, there, in, in, in the building. Um, and then along the way, the client wanted to pull different miners out and plug different miners in because of obviously making money, right? So, so they were doing that and they were blowing fuses and then we, were, we developed a, um, I guess an Excel spreadsheet simply to, balance the miners, what they had to pull out, what they didn't. And then we had to deal with uh, air management. So we created hot aisles and cold aisles to try to keep the cost down. And uh, the hot aisles and cold aisles led to, depending on how they're heated and what was around, was different ratings on on the miners themselves were, were, were running into issues because of the, uh, basically the equipment is, is, is rated for certain Tolerance. So some of our code problems that we ran into was the miners were running into that 40 degrees Celsius while we were trying to balance getting rid of the air, and you know so it was a big balancing act. So that was our first project. It was a bit of a skeleton kind of running at it, but we we, we kind of balanced it out and got it going. But e each miner was. It's air intake, it's a one-to-one. -one. So when you go into a big room and you have all these miners, all these servers running, it's a huge amount of air volume. I mean, we had 84-inch fans pushing air into a 30, so by, 30, 30 by 40 building floor just to, just to be able to supply enough air that goes in to push enough air that goes out. Um, so that was some of the some of the uh, issues that we had. And then, some of, and then we went further and we did um, more of a planned approach on the next one, we sat down and designed it. And uh, we 
used uh, bus works at different uh, larger transformers and systems, and we're able to mitigate that with docking directly outside. So I didn't bring a bunch of pictures. I was going to bring a bunch of pictures of the different sites, no, and, I, and I think next time I'll do that. I'll, I'll, and I'll show the seat pans, and I'll show uh, some of the buildings that we built, and uh, how we how we went ahead to start with doing this. And, Kind of where we ended up. So but there's a lot of things you got to take into account. You know, there's like there's like sound attenuation too as well, right? You know, like it just makes so much noise, right? You have to contain that. Um, and then at that site, what was it powered by? So we had we had two 1475 gas, so 1.5 megawatt generators, uh, two of them, uh, feeding basically a, a whole lineup of transformers and disconnects, feeding. They have a transformer disconnect feeding each rack. Each rack had about 200 miners. And then from there, uh, we exhausted the uh, air straight outside. And one, one of the things that we really want to uh, consider in the future, too, is actually making them green, right? Uh, like recycling the, the hot air, you know, uh, you know, if you're using it for heat, you know, maybe piping it into some surrounding buildings or, you know, uh, you know, like you guys right now probably have some miners in your garage, right? Getting your getting your garage. Nobody's uh, saying anything. No one's like. No one wants to get told when it happens. Yeah. Most people don't. Yeah. But but yeah, you know, um, I, I know quite a few guys that actually heated the garage through through the winter just to have a couple miners in there, and they, you're making money off it, right? You know, in Russia they were selling uh, miners to heat your home, right? I saw that in a radiator. Yeah, no. yeah, that's really cool. So, so we got into this because oil and gas companies were going, we're going broke. Let's try some other revenue models. Yeah. We have the assets, we have the gas. And so that's how I got brought into this. I was doing conventional oil and gas engineering, electrical engineering, and I was asked to be brought into different clients that I had to actually start, start installing this equipment. Um, where are you guys today with that? Where, where is it today? Uh, there's been probably five customers and it's just starting to heat up now again. Yeah, so it went dormant for a while because prices went down and people were like, oh geez, we spent too much. What do we, you know, let's just let, leave things alone, let it run. And then it went quiet for about six, eight months, probably the last six, eight months. And now we're starting to get more calls again. Going, hey, we'd like to look at this now. We have some seat cans, we have a building. Uh, we have a group of us that want to work together. Um, so what we do is we do the design work, right? So we'll we'll do the layouts of the racks and the generation and do the whole procurement design of a, an area that we have that. So I, I don't get involved in but, but the algorithms nice thing, in the back and that stuff. The nice thing about Alberta is there's so much gas, right? Why would you actually go in and use your residential, residential like electricity for you know a huge mining facility? So, you know, if, if you're looking at a, a larger, you know, uh, facility, right, uh, there's more people coming to that area where they actually have gas wells. They're just going to throw a jet set on there. You throw it in a sea can and, you know, you're making a million dollars a year. So uh, probably the other biggest thing is, uh, is getting, getting the equipment at a decent price, right? So you're trying to buy surplus equipment you're trying to buy you know zero hour we and refurbished type of equipment and stuff some of the equipment that we did our first job we had switch gear coming up from alabama you know so that's coming into alberta so yeah switch gear coming from alabama we cleared out every every supplier in, in alberta maybe even across canada just on receptacles when we first started like just every receptacle is completely gone and, and steve is so, so steve is an engineer I'm a procurement guy, right? So he's the guy that designs it. I'm the guy that actually finds deals on stuff. So I'll go around the world and I'll like, you know, save you some money, and then he's the guy that actually designs it so he saves money. So, you know, it's a really good combo. But yeah, even even at the start, we went with conventional, you know, 240 volt plugs. This is just a let's say an S9. You plug an S9 in. It's it's you know 8.9 amps, 240 volts, and we are rushing just to do. Our transformers were, you know, 480, 12240 uh, transformers, and uh, it wasn't a conventional server application. Now, going forward, everything is is um, 
you know, or 10 to 40 the ground. So that you save extra wiring. There's a lot of different things that kind of come up as you can plan your large animals. Uh, same with the HVAC. There's, there's a lot of more things to do with HVAC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, next time we'll have some, you know, some pictures of some facilities and stuff like that and showing some pro past projects and whatnot. But uh, that's that's what we, we pretty much do is, you know, get people up and going out in the field uh, for a lot less cost. And and the cost the cost per kilowatt is what? Around around we, what compared to like residential? Six six hundred. We're doing yeah, we're doing at about six cents a kilowatt hour. So. Yeah, so so you know, if you're doing residential, you're doing it probably around, what is it, 12 or 13? Yeah. Right around there? So, yeah, so when you go into another kind of area like that, and we know the guys that are doing those facilities, so, you know, if you're looking at doing a lot of miners, right, we can introduce you to those guys too. So, yeah. That's it. How's your products at? Take all that energy, heat them. Yeah, up, that's that the heat. idea. Yeah. No, no heat. Yeah. And grow stuff yeah. from the heat that throws off the map. Hundred percent. Yeah. And then take some of the CO two off the generators. Yeah. And include that in the I know in Medicine Hat, what you're looking at doing with all the hot air heat, right? You're actually looking at piping it into that uh, hockey arena and heating that, like instead of using the heaters. So imagine how much that's going to save the hockey arena for you. It's not contaminated air. No. Just some bits in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all we had. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Most people here already know me from last week, but a quick introduction for you guys over here. Um, so my name is Daniel. I first got into crypto through trading Forex markets. So that was my first feel into, into any type of trading was more crypto and uh, Forex and stuff like that. Um, got into crypto when some friends just talked to me about it, pre this whole crazy rush everyone knows about. Um, I'm a big believer in research, just like uh, Mike was talking about. So I'm a big thinker. I love to go deep into the roots of things, really in the, in the background. Um, you know, found a lot of things like you know Ripple when it was at half of a cent. Um, so basically, the lowest ever was in the history of ever. Um, we run still the largest Ripple group with 110,000 uh, people in the community on Facebook. Um, we obviously helped, I don't even know how many people, again, we don't do investment, but a lot of people looked and did their own research after us inviting him to our group, showing the videos and research we found and the articles we've written. I helped a lot of people make money, right? That was the biggest and funnest thing. Um, but I'm a big believer in the adoption of crypto, as we all are, probably as you all know. Um, any investment is only really as good as what it does for the earth at the end of the day, especially if you want a sound investment or something that's gonna be doing really good. And of course, this isn't investment advice, but we obviously wanna see Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies succeed, right? And a lot of people always wonder, what does succeeding mean? It doesn't actually mean price rising. Believe it or not, just because a price rises does not mean it's good. Exxon, I think, is a, what's that company that was Enron or something, I forget, a while ago, right? Something like that, price does not mean it's good at the end of the day, right? Utility yes. means it's good. Seeing things actually happen. So. Bitcoin, if you guys actually ever look into the Bitcoin, I'm just gonna go into this right now. I think it's actually on coin market cap. I'm just gonna go into this. Um, so if you go into coin market cap and Bitcoin, 
There's a little saying that's actually at the very bottom of most cryptos that are well known. They'll tell you a little brief summary about them on CoinMarketCap, right? And with Bitcoin, if this thing will ever load, there we go. Um, scroll down here. Yeah. <laughs> so here you go, about Bitcoin right here. As you can see, Bitcoin was written and it was originally called a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, okay? Now what that mostly means is people don't realize that Bitcoin was actually meant to be spent, not only saved. We love saving it, we love seeing the value as human beings and things intrinsically grow, but at the end of the day, what every human being, what all of us should ultimately dream if you are a true believer of cryptocurrency, is you want this to eventually be where you can spend it on everyday things. You want this to become what was in the 1950s, the US dollar with the gold back standard. You want everything eventually to be become with the Bitcoin back standard. Now, as you can tell during these past, what, almost decade of Bitcoin being around, um, there hasn't been much usage. In fact, I believe the first ever transaction, if you guys are aware of it, was Bitcoin, someone bought actually Papa John's pizza, two pizzas for over like 250,000 Bitcoin. He gave a friend that was willing to spend actual cash to buy the pizza for him. So it was online in a forum, he said, someone, I'm willing to buy pizza, is someone willing to buy pizza for my cash? I'll give you 250,000 Bitcoin, right? And someone said, sure. I appreciate. I forget how much that Bitcoin's worth now. I think if you do the math, something like, like five hundred million dollar piece of pizza essentially is what it was. It was ridiculous. You said two hundred fifty thousand Bitcoin. Something like that. Some ridiculous amount. Like you can actually go. That's like that's that's like two point five billion. Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. Like yeah. it was an, a stupid amount of money. You can go on to even there's still forum screenshots. Yeah. The guy I think his name is like Nico or something like that. You can literally find it. I used to make memes wow. about it. It's hilarious. Right. He's probably kicking himself in the ass right now. But at the same time, I'm actually going to tell you this most. Bitcoin um, enthusiasts actually are not sad when they spend their coin at an early stage. A lot of the people that were big in it, they, they're glad that they actually use it for the purpose it was used for and not as an investment tool. So that's what we're actually talking about is right now, if Bitcoin became successful, we should be able to, for instance, today, when you're done your drinks and stuff, being able to pay with your Bitcoin. That is the end goal for all of us here, which is what's happening. So what's really cool about this year and why we call, what we were actually calling this about three years ago, we say, First, there's gonna be speculators. The first big wave is gonna be speculators. People jumping in on the emerging side. I'm not sure if you guys know about the bell curve of adoption. It's in almost any single industry in the world. It's first innovators get in, then the mass population, then late adopters, right? The sound people. And usually if you see people again at the start, it's riskiest when you get up like there and you're getting with the mass crowd. It's kind of already becoming mainstream. And at the very end, you're the, the people that again, like you know, parents were just setting up Facebook for. Right? It's been out for decades, it's already there. Those are the late adopters. The early adopters are the people that, for instance, um, we're utilizing Facebook in the college days. Those were the people over here at the early adoption stage. So with Bitcoin, we're actually in a phase right now where there's more utility happening than ever before. So back in the day, there was a lot of crazes with mining, new coins, ICOs, this and that, investment, this and that, new exchanges opening, right? We've seen, we talked about how there's been um, almost 10 times the amount of markets open up. There's been almost 100 times the amount of coins since about three years ago. Um, the entire area in that side is blown up, but what about utility, right? So fun fact, Japan was the first country to kind of mass adopt Bitcoin usage. So right now, if you do go to Japan, you can spend it, I think, at over like 200,000 vendors in Japan except Bitcoin. So almost anywhere in Japan, you could, if you guys right now Bitcoin, go to travel there, you could spend it like cash. They actually are adopted and are cool with that. It's really awesome. Now, of course, as we know, North America is kind of looked at as, as almost like the gold standard of the world, when if it, unless it happens in North America, it's not legitimate, right? As some people like to put it. We don't believe that always, but that's what a lot of people think. So with cryptocurrency, the cool thing about it right now is it's actually being used more as cash than ever before. So I'm just gonna show you, I'm not sure if you guys know the Vinkel. Uh, Whole Foods, Amazon. So, Again, yeah. in, in Japan, actually, you know what their electricity costs per kilowatt? It's 21 cents. So it's even higher, it's right? It's even higher there. So they're using it hard for mining. So now this is something yeah. that came out four days ago. When did this big bull rush come again, guys? Do you guys remember when this whole crazy rush this past week happened? I forget. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an investor. I don't do investing. It was like 10 days ago, roughly. Yeah. Well, recently, it's kind of interesting, like we were talking about, that right now there's more volume going into Bitcoin than ever before, right? So we saw the 24-hour volume. If you saw it, I'll go back to it for you guys that missed it, right? If I go back down here. History of Bitcoin, you see those little squiggly lines at the bottom here? That's the volume. So during that last rush we have, you see, you know, 24 hour volume, one, two billion. Oh, it went finally up to, you know, four, five. Oh my goodness, 
12 billion, 19 billion, 24 hour volume, 13, crazy, right? That was during the peak. Look where it is right now. Higher, double than what it ever was in the history of 24 hour people buying or selling Bitcoin. So now, 30, 33 billion. That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of adoption, as we call it, right? Yeah. Regard, that proves, what this proves is buying the volume higher is wow. either A, there's people internally trading more than ever before, but yeah. it's usually less likely as adoption as markets get older because there's less uh, fraud that can happen in more mature markets than early markets, right? So very interesting there. And at the same time, as you can see, there's actually a Forbes article. Forbes is probably one of the biggest news out there, saying that almost every major retailer is right now on the back end accepting Bitcoin in North America. Hmm. That's a very, that's a huge thing. So imagine, and we're actually right now, if you're in the UK, you can get a Coinbase, we just talked about Coinbase, you can get a prepaid debit card from Coinbase where you can spend your cryptos anywhere in the world, but it's a, it, only I think for like European uh, residents are getting out the first roll out of it. So right now there's people in UK that have a Coinbase account, they have their Bitcoin, their Coinbase, 30% rose like it did you know, this past week. They went and spent a grand on the, at the bars with their Coinbase card and spent you know, 0 0.05 Bitcoin whatever the case might be, and had a good time. So this is really cool because this wasn't possible before, as we're aware of, right? Before you have to, there was like you know, documentaries showing how difficult it was for certain people to live strictly off of Bitcoin, right? And now, in this, this past week, they did a trial period where they basically spent it a bunch of different places. It wasn't just, um, you know, it wasn't just Starbucks. It was also Bed Bath & Beyond, Nordstrom, uh, Whole Foods, a lot of places. Overstock, as you guys are aware, was the first uh, online store that accepted, or major online store that accepted crypto, like pre-Silk Road and all that fun jazz. Now, as you can see this happening, this is where there's going to be more people using it. When you can actually use it like cash, people are gonna start spending, because now liquidity is not a problem. So this is a very interesting time we're living in, because it's for the first time, big institutions are not only admitting to doing investing, like Fidelity or you know um, JP Morgan and things like that last year, there's now major retailers that are going to be allowing you to spend it as cash, not just an investment tool. And that's huge when you actually think about how institutions think, right? Institutions are very, very, you cannot still to this day spend stocks in Starbucks. Let's just bring that up, right? How long have stocks been around for? How secure are they? How trusted are they? Why can't you spend those in Starbucks but they're accepting Bitcoin yet? It's showing how advanced they are going into it that a lot of people that are thinking more on like I call the taxi man space, they're not thinking like I like to do under the surface and realizing that's actually a big freaking point that I cannot spend, Amazon, I can't spend Starbucks stock at Starbucks, but I can spend Bitcoin. <laughs> Something's going on here with adoption and mass adoption and utilization. Now again, I'm not sure if you guys talk about this, but I'm from the Forex industry. Do you know how many dollars per day are transacted? It'll make this number up here. 5.2 trillion, I think. Yeah, it makes this number up here of our all the cryptos in the world, the 24 hour volume of all cryptos, let alone Bitcoin, makes it look like peanuts, yeah. right? There's over 50 times the daily volume in, in um, currencies, not even stocks, just in currencies, than there is in crypto. Yeah. So just for, if you do the math and volume, and in understanding volume on regular markets, like five trillion a day is an average day, we've seen certain booms where you know crypto goes up three times in volume, imagine when that happens with Forex as well too. So if that were to happen, and it becomes where we're starting to use it with that much volume, Naturally, if you guys are ever aware, volume and market cap do have somewhat of a relation where the higher the volume, usually a market cap has to be high to support it with a non-artificial non uh, inflation of volume, right? So that's why Bitcoin, you can see nothing surpasses the volume of Bitcoin ever because it's the biggest coin, it has the largest market cap, people are more secure about trading it. So really cool to imagine what happens, I don't even know the US dollar, if you guys wanna Google the US dollar's volume daily, just imagine what happens when like 10% of that, 10% of spending, 2% like Fidelity said, 2% of all spending goes into crypto instead of everyday cash. If you could just imagine what that would do to the price, I don't even know, right? So that's a little bit of knowledge for you guys and just understanding as well where we are on not just the investment and it's cool trading and all that stuff, but actually the utilization of Bitcoin for its real purpose took almost 10 years for the regular world to catch on to. And that's just being tested right now. 10 years to be tested, but it's actually happening. So it's a, it's very unique to think about what's gonna happen in the future and where it's gonna go, right? Where you might be able to, with Canadian art, whatever it's called, their registered uh, trading accounts, yeah. right? Maybe you'll be able to eventually just go into it with Scotia Online Trade and buy Bitcoin with your, uh, your tax-free savings account and things like that, right? So 
that was a little bit of information I wanted to give to you guys. Do some more research on the utilization. Because again, as I like to always tell people, if you're looking at news, you're kind of you're going to know things before the people on the radio or you know uh, C or CNBC. Try to get it even earlier because that's where you're going to see mass adoption really happen is when people get the news out there of something really cool like this. Yeah. Hey Dan. So, yeah. You guys mentioned uh, what was the best best places to actually get news off of first. Right. So I actually yeah. went to. Uh, oh, so Twitter. right here. So there's two places. Obviously, if you look at on Coin Market Cap, it's really good for two things. One is a website. One is source code, which is like a GitHub. So if you guys are coders and you want to find out about legitimate projects, illegitimate projects, we were talking about the white paper and stuff, source code is where you search that. And then under here, the social tab, when you click on that, it will usually show two things depending on the coin. One is if they have a corporation or a foundation or something like that, their Twitter page. Almost every crypto company usually will do any announcement of their own. They use Twitter as a public announcement place because I think legally you're allowed to give company announcements on Twitter, it's weird that way. So they use that or Reddit when it comes to people that are very, very keen on projects, the early adopters of people that are, you, you basically get the developers responding to you, which you don't get that on CNBC. You never, I've never seen a developer for any blockchain actually be given an interview. They're mostly price speculators, right? Which is after the fact. This, yeah. you'll see, again, we were talking about the happening, right? About the point. You're gonna see in here a huge discussion about it, right? Here's right here about the, uh, the Starlink plan. Who was talking about that earlier too, right? There's a lot of people in here we heard news here, it's right here on Reddit, and I was talking about if I probably click on this, maybe two days ago on Reddit. So super fresh, everything is fresh on there. You can see from how many points and comments, how fresh it is and how excited it, the, the news is. Um, I've seen a lot of, see that shows about certain things like here. I just talked about this, right? And it's right there on the Reddit, exactly like I was saying. So news articles, right there news from Reddit. Because if you guys are aware, news articles are just journalists scouring for a story. Where do journalists scour? Right? They don't have secret sources. They go on Reddit and they're just basically copying and pasting some very geeky person that's actually doing the work and they just copy and paste it. And that's why you see news articles have the same <laughs> plagiarized paragraph over and over yeah. and over and over again. All grabbing it from the same place. So Lightning Network, again, if you want to find out about Lightning Network, a uh, really good place is Reddit as well. You'll learn from who the developers are. You can kind of find out and even follow just the developers and what they write when they come if you want to stay away from the FUD or the FOMO or any of the, the random news that's out there and just stick to the good shit, that's the way to go. Um, also on Reddit, if you're into some certain small altcoins, um, you will usually get better response on things like Telegram or Discord. So when you go onto the projects Reddit, usually it'll be like their official announcement page, like here's our white paper, here's our coin, hurrah, hurrah. And they'll have links to every single type of communication you can have with the development team. Always use those, that's where you're gonna get all the news from again. If there's fake or real news, there's where you're gonna get the answer. Hey, were you guys hacked? You'll tell if they've ghosted the community or not on that Discord. They'll be like, oh, it's kind of concerning. A bunch of stuff's getting talked about and you guys know where to be found. Or if they're very active, like, hey guys, they'll message you and give some, some good insights for you guys right there as well. So, uh, any questions about that, I guess? Anything else we need to cover for that? No, pretty straightforward. Anyone else have anything that we haven't covered in today's uh, workshop? Any questions you guys might have had? in your head, feel free to ask them. That's what the perfect time is the end. Q&A, time yeah. to learn some more stuff. Oh wait, we got three questions here. So we'll go one, two, and three. We'll do a, a clockwise fashion. When to burn that all day. No, that's right, so what was your question? Uh, do you have any ETFs uh, in a crypto? Uh, I don't do ETFs. Again, I'm a big believer of holding the actual coin. Um, again, I do Forex trading, which is the same thing with BitMEX leverage trading. Uh, there's a lot of unregulated brokers in the world which uh, allow trading of uh, cryptocurrencies and leverage. Um, again, it's nice if people like leverage, but I always warn you guys, as a trader myself, I'd recommend anyone that's not a very experienced stock trader with leverage to avoid leverage at all costs. Just stick to trading one-to-one -one or yeah. buying coins at the regular price. I've seen more people lose money than gain money with leverage because it's like being a surgeon compared to putting on a band-aid. Everyone can put on a band-aid and heal a wound. Not everybody can do open heart surgery, and I recommend not teaching people. Get a professional kind of thing if you're gonna do leverage. There's lots of good traders out there that'll do, you know, 50-50 splits of the profits they make for you and stuff like that. That's what I'd usually recommend, because um, BitMEX, again, I have friends that trade on it. They'll do, uh, you can have a trade open if you're holding it long-term and doing like swing trading. They can go under maintenance, and they love to go under maintenance during high volatile times, because they know that that's where people will, they see things go wrong and they make more money off of people closing out their accounts and marginal out. Right. They shut that down anytime. Yeah, oh, there's not, well, they'll just be like, oh, today we're doing maintenance, no one can enter or exit really? your trades for the next two hours. That's crazy. Right, and it's a, 
as you guys know, crypto is unregulated. Basically, yeah. it's unregulated. So if you're putting your money in any crypto, aside from Coinbase, because it's based out of New York and has a bit license and all that, you're basically putting your money in the Wild West. I'm a big believer in a lot of these things. Again, they are trustworthy, but you have to do your own research on what you're gonna trust that's unregulated. I'm not gonna give any advice for that, okay? So ETFs, feel free to do them. I just love to hold the own coin because, again, you can hold it on a ledger. If a broker, for instance, if you, what I usually recommend if you're buying a coin from an exchange, move it immediately to your ledger because if an exchange get, you cannot get your coins hacked on the blockchain, right? The only way if you had a ledger or anything is if someone got your private seed password. Yeah. It is basically the most secure way. I've seen over a dozen exchanges get hacked because exchanges get hacked from some you know idiot employee having their email opened or yep. click a phishing email, someone gets access to their account, and then just, they just go on like a user and just say, I'm gonna move things from this wallet to this wallet because I have admin access, right? And we've seen everyone says they have cold storage like, uh, oh, the last one. Like, well, yeah, Binance, right? They yeah. love cold storage, but still 40 million was not in cold storage. If that was your that was 10 storage. million, that's tough, tough shit in yeah. a sense, right? So. I've had friends but lose thirty thousand dollars from exchange hacks. So the, the good news on that hack though is that they at least had an, an internal insurance program in place, so that mm -hmm. taking a, a piece of the profit from everybody's transactions. Yeah, it's and so they're still reimbursing. It slowly reimburses. But they try to do that, like yeah. the one with CoinRail when that got okay, yeah. hacked too. This, they, but again, it takes yeah. time to pay back oh, forty definitely. million dollars in profits, right? Because they still need to keep their doors open. Yeah. Um, what was your question? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Found XRP early. You get any other ones? That you um, I've been saying for like the past, again, it's not investment advice, but I love the team behind Ravencoin. Um, so okay. Ravencoin, I'll just pop it up for you guys. It's actually now, I was into it when it was in like the below top 200 coins again. I love coins that are really awesome development teams, but no PR. That's my bread and butter. I love ones that don't have PR because that means I can take my time researching and get in before the pump. Um, yeah. So where is it over? It might be right here. Oh, there it's it is. now at number 43 Ravencoin. Uh, this one, I would, I've seen it since inception. Its inception was about four cents. So again, from its ICO, if you, it didn't have an ICO, but since its start, it was like two to four cents, as you can see, right? So um, pretty cool project, but it's backed by the people that made Overstock. So if you guys know Overstock, a billion dollar company, they invested $10 million to help this get developed, um, which is Patrick Byrne. There's Bruce Fenton, which is a top security lawyer in crypto. Yeah, He's one of the chairman of it as well. And then Tron Black is the coder, so you can actually look up all those names and stuff. But as you can tell, they're getting pretty well known because they're doing security tokens. So if you guys all know what ERC20, um, it's basically the code that allows you to dividend to, to share tokens, but it's obviously highly illegal. It's a lot of scams, a lot of basically like, it's really hard to be a legitimate company in the ICO space, right? So what they did is they created a security token offering. It has different coding then ERC20, similar functionalities, but imagine it's like, you know, what's the difference between C++, Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, they're all different coding, but they can also make something look similar on a UI side, right? So uh, what Ravencoin does is basically, it could allow all stocks to be issued on Ravencoin instead of the NASDAQ. Um, it would cost zero dollars to actually create an IPO from now on. It would cost zero dollars to message all investors. It would cost zero dollars to pay out dividends. Um, you would have every single investor, no matter how big or small, tracked down to the dollar, which, um, again, I work for publicly traded companies. If you want to try to do an investor shareholder meeting, send out letters to every single investor, know yeah. who your shareholders are. Yeah. They, it, it is a world designed for secrecy, it's and expensive. it is impossible. It is impossible. Yeah. Like, even with holders of brokers, like, oh, we know that this broker has 10 million shares. We don't know how many clients are holding that shares or how much each client owns. None of that's known. Yeah. So Ravencoin allows you to do all that. You can even send messages directly to every shareholder not even needing to know their name, just their wallet address. So for instance, I could issue a coin today for a Bitcoin meetups. It could be, let's. this would just be an example for everyone's brain here. It's not real, right? No real Facebook, but this is like an example of how it works. I could issue a token where everyone here has a token for the Bitcoin meetups and it'll have a circulating supply where each person has one. If you have a token, it's free to come, but you have to pay for a token, let's say for $5 if you're brand new. Every dollar we get in, I'm gonna dividend to every current token holder, right? So if you're early on in this Bitcoin meetup, so we only had 10 meet members, right? Now it's 1,000 members, so that's $5,000 dividended out. Those early adopters probably would've gotten 50 to $100 in dividends, and I could've done it all through Ravencoin, click of a button, I don't even need to know who your name is, how much you hold, I just say, we're paying out this $5, click it and spread it among all of our tokens that we're currently Paid out, and you guys would see on your Ravencoin app, oh, I just got more, uh, I got a dividend from this payout, from Bitcoin meetup, awesome, 
right? Really cool. It's also a coin that's based off the Bitcoin protocol, so very much the same security as Bitcoin if you guys know how um, it was designed. So it was actually a, the, the code was a fork of Bitcoin, just like Litecoin was, if you guys don't know what that means, but it means almost that it's like copying, you love the model, you copy, just tweak small things instead of redoing everything. So Bitcoin's super strong, they did that, they changed a few things. So one was allowing people to put in a document, an IFSP, I believe it's called, document, which is why it's allowed to be security token. So I can have an actual lawyer sign a notary, say, okay, this is a legal company in Canada, working under Canadian law, so if I'm buying their token, I'm following Canadian laws and everything that's on the paper, it's all signed, I can call the legal company and all that fun shit, right? Um, so they now change an algorithm where you can mine it, so if any of you guys have a computer at home, you can mine it just like you can with Bitcoin. Um, the different factors, of course, you might make more dollars per day than Bitcoin. It is a higher ROI and almost has always been since I've been mining it. Um, it's also one of the most secure networks for ASIC resistance. So if you guys knew, uh, Bitcoin is used to be mined from everyone's computer. Then when the Chinese people came up with their crazy tech, like the, the S9 and stuff, they started making way more money where it's like, if you didn't have an S9, you basically made nothing, yeah. right? Um, Ravencoin is impermeable for ASICs, which means no matter what, a graphics card that you bought today is probably gonna make sure a little bit less than five years from now, yeah. but it's not like what happened with Bitcoin where if you were using your graphics card, you're gonna make now maybe like a one millionth of a cent, where if you have an ASIC, you make you know, two, three dollars. It, it'll be consistent for your hardware, which is very unique. It's very useful for being actually peer-to-peer -peer and good for poor people, because poor people can't afford ASICs. That kind of defeats the purpose of Bitcoin if you can't secure the network unless you're rich. Right? Yeah. So really love that. That's a project to tell people about. As you can see, the price has also been pretty hardy. In fact, I tell everyone, and this is kind of like a little, a little tidbit, it's not investment advice, but something to look into. I notice that whenever Bitcoin does a pump, usually after we notice, everything happens away. So it rides up a bit and it rides down a bit. Whenever the ride down happens a bit, usually at the initial point, altcoins go crazy because everyone's moving their Bitcoin into other investments or into cash, right? So here's an example. During this past few days, we had Bitcoin rising. You can see Bitcoin is this uh, is this orange line here. So you can see because it's going down, it means Bitcoin to Ravencoin was rising. So Bitcoin is gaining power, Ravencoin wasn't. So it's going down. Then right here, a huge spike on Ravencoin. Right, that's what happens. Bitcoin gets its volume, people move it into other altcoins. Out of the, you know, what we saw was $14 billion that was purchased of Bitcoin over those past 24 hours. Uh, as you can see, there was 26 million of it that went into Ravencoin. That was enough to pump it during that uh, past seven days, was about 30%. Right, so people wrote that 50% or 30% gain on Bitcoin for the first month, then in one day, Raven did 30% just from a little bit of Bitcoin moving away from it. So really cool to look into alternate coins. Um, for trading, again, you could be on the bad side of it. See, people that decide to get in late lost 26% as well. So that's why I say it's not investment advice. You gotta be careful about what we call rise and, and falls in markets, but um, it's always useful. And I always tell people the nicest thing is, um, it's kind of my recommendation of trading, especially if you're new, stick to coins and projects and only trade between coins and projects that you believe in no matter what. The reason why I'm saying that and why I don't do EFT trading either is if I'm in Bitcoin and I moved all my crap over to Ravencoin, let's say yesterday, and I lost 26%, yeah. that sucks, sure. But the nice thing is if you're holding in projects you believe in, just like people that bought at Bitcoin when it was at you know, 10,000 last year and went down to 3,000, now it's back up to 10,000, as long as you hold, you can't lose value in good projects. Yeah. So good projects are again, like I, I, like, I'll, I would day trade Tesla or Amazon or Apple because sure, even if I move into the, that stock or coin and it crashes, as long as I hold on, I know that my value will be good there for the next two, three, four years. Because I believe in the project long term, but I'm going to day trade its volatility at the same time. Does everyone make sense of that, right? Yeah. So hold on to the projects you believe in and trade in between projects you believe in. So even if you get a bad trade in, you're still holding a coin you genuinely love and believe in. You're not stuck with junk, right? I've seen that. That's the only time I've ever seen coins and people really shoot themselves in the foot. It's like, I bought junk because it was going up like crazy. I didn't even believe in the project. I was just there to to get in and out, but that's why everyone relies on Bitcoin, right? Everyone here is probably here because they know Bitcoin's not gonna crash and they don't have any certainty that it's gonna die next year, right? We don't know that about any other coin, honestly, right? We don't really know that about any other coin, so it's nice to hold on to those certain coins that you do believe in too. So that's my, uh, oh, and we have another question over there. Yeah? Yeah, just one thing that I have trouble differentiating from is like how do you tell the difference between like your artificial pump trading volume versus like actual network transaction volume? Um, so everything on CoinMarketCap is exchange volume. None of it's transactional volume. Yeah, but that could still be artificially 
Like yeah, so, so all this means is this is anything you see here is not on that volume means people actually purchasing goods, right? So none of it's actually purchasing goods. All that volume would be on the actual blockchain, right? So the blockchain shows Bitcoin trading from wallet to wallet. When you're on an exchange, they don't, most exchanges, unless when you, uh, they're coming out with decentralized exchanges as people know about, right? That'll be a different world where you're gonna see, it's gonna be difficult to tell. But right now, exchanges hold all their Bitcoin in one wallet, which is a hot wallet, and they have a cold wallet. All the, none of the money actually leaves a wallet when all this trading's happening. So all the exchanges on Binance, all the money's still in one wallet, it's just an electronic ledger, and then when someone withdraws, they take from that big funds and give it to their Bitcoin wallet. So none of that shows on your actual blockchain. With decentralized exchanges, they're trying to use actual blockchains for transactions. Now that won't happen on Bitcoin because of the transaction network's so slow, it's not meant to be for trading, but like Ripple, for instance, they can handle 3,000 transactions a second, right? Um, if they ever created something for that, you would then be able to see, and if you go onto ripple.net, like if I went to the right there to Ripple, you could actually see every transaction on the ledger. So that's where to tell from that. Now with artificial, now the question is, how do you know if, what, if this is genuinely people buying in or a pump and dump? Very hard. What I usually do is it's about the volume. Volume determines when things are going in. So anytime you see a pump, usually a pump equates volume is happening. If there's no volume and a price is going up, that's very strange. That means there's like a liquidity <laughs> problem with that coin. Sometimes yeah. it's like good arbitrage. So you notice like, hey, I can basically trade within a few friends and we can hike up the price like, you know, 50%, uh, which will make us with our holdings about $10,000, only cost us $2,000 in trading. Let's do it to make eight grand, right? There's some people that do that. And again, I, I always like to tell it from high volume coins. So if you're on a high 24 hour volume, like, it's very difficult to artificially pump Bitcoin at this price. You need to literally put in $10 billion of transactions. That's not gonna happen from any small group of people, right? So it's gonna be very difficult for people to process that. Small coins, like the ones I showed with 5,000 volume for 24 hours, that means if I were to put in $10,000 right then and there, I could probably pump the price to whatever I wanted to, right? So those are, I usually stay away from coins below a $500,000 or $100,000 even a day volume is the first notification of it. Um, second is, again, seeing the community, if there's actual news going around a coin. So if a coin's silently pumping, and it's like you know a coin that doesn't really have any PR, nothing's going on, they didn't release a new technology, they didn't update their ledger or their code, that's when you, what usually happens is a lot of investors are on like Telegram groups and private groups, a bunch of people with money called whales, and they look at a coin that's flat and that there's not that much movement, they're like, you know what, if we hit this right now, it's gonna spike on all of the charts, you know, the, the, the mo top gainers of the day and stuff. They know it's gonna hit those markets and new people that are only looking at top gainers are gonna see this going up and they're like, okay, we can pump this once, let it drop a bit, pump it again. From that second pump, people are gonna go crazy and excited and expect a third pump because that's how markets work. So we're gonna manipulate it so we can get out on that third pump while everyone's buying in. We're gonna be the liquidity on the other side to get out, right? And that's again why I always look at order books too. If there's a nice thick order book on both sides, you have, a, you have confidence to know it's not a pump and dump as much, but you need to look at the order book long term. So that's the downside is order books, you have to check daily if you wanna be a trader for that. So you might see on a pump day, the order book's nice and thick on both sides because they padded it for that day, but they can also click a button on their computer, cancel the order, and the order book thinks that back down to zero, right? So if I notice the order book is thick for like a week and it's consistently a nice thickness, and I know that it's not someone, one person manipulating it, I'm more safe going into that and using those coins. Um, it's very difficult as well, just because the at the end of the day, it's all, like everything is a wave. You'll never know if it's genuine or not. For instance, last year, the pump, I like my personal belief is the pump to 10,000 Bitcoin was natural, yeah. to 20,000 was pump and dump the inflation oh, fake. Yeah. That's my belief. When I got into Ripple, I was, at, I was my goal was to actually get out at like the 20, 30, 40 cent mark. I believed that $1 to me was like, in 10 years from now, I was expecting Ripple to hit a dollar. <laughs> When it hit three, so would it be surpass a dollar? In my mind was like, something's wrong. I don't know, it's like, I, I had a, I had like a, something like, like an alert go off, like, this isn't natural, right? No. So look, look at that, what's going on, guys? <laughs> so yeah, so if you want, we got a, Neil. Just wants to come up, Neil? Yep, he's yeah. gonna come up and talk about CloudPoint. Are you oh, good? Awesome, you yeah, good? we're all good. So you guys, any last no. questions, we'll get to see at the end, we're all good. Awesome, we'll give him a round of applause. Thank you. Come on up, Neil. Yep, we got time, and then. You want to use my laptop? Oh, okay. What's on there? I sent you an email. You want to put that up there?
So how many here got a wallet on their phone? Most of us. Wallet shit. How many here don't know what a wallet is for your for your phone? Everybody kind of knows what a wallet is. <laughs> so if you have a phone, pull your phone out, and we can maybe give them psyllium just as a general plan. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. We because this would be a good exercise. You guys all should have a wallet on your phone. Actually, yeah. uh, XLM. So you XLM. Can download the blockchain wallet. You guys get fifty dollars in XLM uh, coins right now. So, put so if you oh, go to your app store and then type in blockchain wallet, and then I'll come around and make sure you get the right one. Just put up your hand and you know I'll show you which one. Yeah, you get you get fifty dollars worth of XLM, which is amazing. Okay, so everybody should, today should get some app store when they leave. Yeah. Have a wallet on their phone. Seller is XLM. Yeah, yeah, that's the wallet. That's your dashboard. That's the wallet. Yeah. Yeah. So you go to the page of that. They give you an opportunity to apply for the XLM. Fifty dollars. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mm, he's young. Like a po pro coming out here listening to him. So it's got to be simple for people, right? Get them, teach everybody to get a wallet. Buy a hundred dollars of Bitcoin. Okay. When you send them, you get a thousand in Bitcoin in your wallet. Give it away for Christmas gifts. Everybody gets fifty bucks. Yeah. Show them how to. You know how you teach people Bitcoin? Get them to get the wallet, and you send them hunt fifty bucks. Back in a year ago, I was sending like ten dollars. You know how much it cost me to send ten dollars? Seventeen bucks. Now was the cost? Yeah. yeah. With the Lightning Network, seventeen cents. Yes, it was. It's awesome, you guys. Come on, get the program. What flows through you sticks to you. Ninety-nine percent we heard tonight. Just boom. That's why he's recording it. Watch it again on the Facebook Live. We're Facebook Live, aren't we? Yep. How cool is that? Right. Now you gotta go back and watch all the episodes. Don't start from the latest one and go backwards, right? Just don't miss a meeting. That's what I would say. So, who's making all the money in the cryptocurrency space? When it went from 1,200 to 23,000 in, in a year. When was that? When was it 1,200 in November of 2016? And then by January of 2018, it peaked at 25,000. That run up, and then it, re it regressed, right? Where is it going now? Like it's always done, seesaw, right? And actually, there's guys that figured out how to make money when it goes down, right? Yeah. Talk to him. He's making money going up and going down. So, who's made all the money since it went down? Because you ever heard, I lost all my money in this. When some people say that, that, that means stupidity, right? Can't fix stupid though. Ignorance is fixable. And most people are ignorant, they just don't know. So you teach them, you're a teacher. And if you have a way of making money while you're learning, that's kind of cool too, right? And that's where John is kind of, he's, he's just, I don't know anybody like that guy. He's so cool, I love coming here. I live in Lacombe, I drive here an hour and a half, and just listen, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> hour and a half back, it's three hours, right? So who's made all the money, guys? From Mr. Tribees, you know, homies, you know, the, the groupies. Who's making all the money the last year and a half? Can't tell you that. It's a secret. That's what we're all here to give the secrets away. Who's making all the money? A lot of traders. Traders and uh, miners. Yeah. Miners. Okay. Holders. So I sold 50 million of mutual funds from 1991 to 2000. And uh, three or whatever, it was ridiculous, okay, it was a joke. Everybody closed their eyes and threw their made money in the mutual funds, right? Boring. <laughs> How many people you know have mutual funds? There's a trillion dollars in RSP mutual funds. There's about three or four trillion dollars outside RSPs and mutual funds. It's retarded, that's just in Canada alone. If you just get 1% of that, you could help a lot of people. Play with 100 bucks, 100 bucks and five of his recommendations. Guaranteed, not guaranteed, you could lose all your money, okay, so put it five, five times 100 is 500 bucks, you can afford to, it's not gonna take food from the table, right? So watch this, who's made all the money? There's, there's the new thing is called wallets. Do you know how many wallets there are? Five million, in three years, okay? Which wallet, what's in your wallet, right? So you, you have this one, it was a token, uh, plus token. Out of, out of China, everything's coming out of China. So it went from 30 cents to 80 bucks. Okay, then the, the copycat, whatever, the next new version, the iPod 3, or the X iPhone, is called Cloud Token. And this guy will just eat it up. Have you heard of it? No, not yet. Insane. Okay, they just had a convention two days ago. All the greatest minds of crypto, 15, 1,500 people were there, and it was just, it, you write down cloud token, go to the website, cloudtoken.com, check it out, read the white paper. I'll have Jan email your experts to evaluate it. Mark my words, cloud token will be at 100 bucks in a year. So do the math. If you had $1,000 in this at 30 cents and it was at 100 bucks, what would that be worth? <laughs> What would that be worth? And I'll be I'll, I'll drop the mic now. So after that, and you and so if you're interested, talk to Jan and he'll 
get to the last second last because I can do that. I'll, I'll, I'll stay tonight. I'll I'll, I'll stay to your office tomorrow because okay, they're they're curious about cloud cloud token. Okay, cool. But you need rep, his rep code number to get in because I swear well, to Jeff, things. So yeah, I love this you guy. Have the code. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Give me his record. Thanks for being a fan of the Philly Market. So, every one of us has like a little flavor that they like about all this stuff. So, uh, an engineer here tonight, uh, another engineer doing uh, you know mining. You got blockchain software development. You've got fans creating communities in Ripple. You've got people interested in even geo mining over there, Kevin. You've got uh, Corey who did mining and he did a bunch of other uh, ICOs like this and other things in his life. You got a lot of different things that go on, and I don't know if this is an ICO, but it's that idea anyway, but you got a lot of things that go on out here, and they're all like branches inside the crypto making you know, genre, right? So there's a lot of branches to the tree, and I have a document that itemizes about 18 different areas of cryptocurrency right now where any of you can get involved like in a side hustle or an interest or whatever. Neil comes from you know MLM and those years back, and he likes things that are affiliate driven. Nick did too, and other people have. Corey was another one there. Um, those do pay, and if you've got a big network around you, and you got people that you know slowly drip in and buy in, these kinds of affiliate marketing tools can be uh, can be somewhat income driven, right? I don't think in Canada we have a lower population. And I don't just see, I don't see them working like they do in America. And, and Daniel's had a lot of uh, experience in America, and he's seen you know volumes that none of us have seen, to be really honest. And, and it really exists, and he knows all about it. So so Canada's a whole other animal, though. We're smaller population less buy-in, less interest, so overall it's, it's, it's very niche for us, okay? Keep that in mind. And that's why you don't see a lot of these things, like that's why I don't make a ton of money doing affiliate codes for Binance, okay, just example. But there's a kid in New York that, you know, knows thousands of people kind of thing, and he's already made, you know, 100 grand just, let's say, right? Through all of the social media and networking community and, 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 and facets, just example. But they can do it in New York. I can't do it in Calgary, right? There's just not enough humans, okay? So think of that, right? So that's the idea. So, but I, I like affiliate marketing, and there's another thing I like about it. It is like a, it's kind of a thing that it just keeps paying you forever. Until you disconnect your login and cancel your email and shit, they'll still send you money somehow, right? And I'll say more about this too in the crypto space. If you can get rewarded with crypto and whatever, even real money, any of it's awesome and amazing. And, and the crypto is not bad to have as an accruing thing that you know, creates value and perpetual value. So it's like, it's costing you fuck all to do this, and you're creating a perpetual value in the reward, and that's not a bad deal either. And that's the thing, it's like, right now, if crypto was a nightclub, they're giving everybody free drinks and passes to come on in, right? Think about it right now. And if you, if you just go you know, from entity to entity, brand to brand, you can collect a lot of things and then be in that same mindset. And then later on, crypto will mature, and all of that, those, those days will be gone. And we'll be talking about it somewhere, you know, at, at, at workshop number 283, and we'll be, remember how all those affiliate things were around those days, and you could make all that money, you know, and it, it won't be there no more. And eventually you'll be paying a membership to get into Binance and companies like that. Yeah, there used to be even, uh, back, yeah. back in the day, there used to be faucets for Bitcoin. So there were literally people that were mining Bitcoin and set up websites where you just connected your wallet and they'll oh, give you 100 yes. Bitcoin a day. A faucet. Just wow. for, just for wow. being involved. Legit. Like 100 Bitcoin a day. That was like 2010. I know, right? right? right. Those yeah. are the days again. See, that's, that's not that far ago, but that was yeah. already well, those it's days. It's, it's a crowdfunding. It's there was I know. A, with, with Ravencoin, there was a faucet like five months ago, they were giving me like 100 Ravencoin a day, which at the peak was about $7 a day they were giving away. Seven bucks a day US, see? So, so even this, like I think, like you said, a crowd, I think crypto is a huge crowd and I would love someone to find a stat or visual that itemizes all of the people that are involved in crypto. It would be lovely to see how many humans have actually participated. And uh, I think it's a lot of people, obviously, and, and it's got the velocity, but it's still coming. There's still more coming. The last stat that I saw was like 0.01% of people have 0.01 have heard or talked about it. Yeah. And then there was less than that. I don't even know the percentage of which owns crypto. But 0 0.13. No. Yeah. <laughs> I like to go to the greed meter on uh, on uh, CNN site here, the greed index. So we'll see what that CNN money has a greed index. You guys can always punch in on this one. Just search greed index on, uh, on Google and it'll come out for you. And this is a good indicator of where the market's at and how people are doing. So let's have a look. Oh, right now we're in fear mode. <laughs> we're scoring a 39 out of, uh, out of 100 right now on extreme fear to extreme greed. And we're, we're, we're just below the half point here, okay? One week ago, it was fear. And one month ago, it was greed. We were at 70. So the greed meter was on 70 and people were buying big. 
And you can look at this, and this is somehow tracking the uh, adoption, buy-in, currency, volumes, all these key words, it's somehow tracking that, and it's trying to indicate that in such a simple graph for everybody to understand. But what I see, and Daniel liked this too, when it's in the green there, it's unbelievable how many people are selling. Like it's the weirdest time on earth. Yeah, yeah. it goes up like this, and it's just like, oh, I, I gotta sell this off, I gotta sell it, I gotta sell it, I gotta sell it, it's like this panic sale thing. And I think they should be buying. Like they're doing the wrong thing. They well, buy said more. They're buying the altcoins yeah. for the profits now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so there's so many things you can be doing, you know, instead of this, instead of selling out when you, when the greed goes up. So it's, it's interesting to watch this uh, this chart. I, I like it. So uh, May eighth from an extreme greed. So May eighth was uh, was an extreme greed mode. So it's <laughs> extreme. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Extreme yeah, green. volatility. Okay. So yeah, learn learn about all this stuff, see what's going on right now, and uh, you guys will find more and more resources coming from me and my team and us, and we'll have more special guests coming in the future. I think at our next meetup we have special guests from this uh, app called Zenoshi, and they're going to be giving away tokens that night for everyone that downloads the wallet. And, Z and Zenoshi, yep, said ten thousand dollars. And Zenoshi is is like a uh, crypto rewards, like a PC points and Air Miles points, uh, uh, shoppers points, and all those points things. It's designed for every company participating in points, and the cryptos are the points, so it's actually quite cool. Whoa. So any company can sign up with Zenoshi and become a point reward giver, a giver, right? And, and then you can purchase you know, at that store or that thing that you guys love, and, and you're getting Zenoshi uh, tokens and stuff. So you're, you're making capital doing that as well, right? So pretty cool stuff. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thanks so much for coming out, you guys, tonight, and, uh, and we'll see you guys again in two weeks, okay? Thanks so much. Yeah. Woo! Thank you.